Welcome to the Select Board Board of Health Sewer Commissioners meeting of January 24th, 2024 at 6.03 p.m. Uh, this meeting will be held in, oh so no, we're not Chris hybrid. Chris can't talk to us without turning the Zoom on. What? Chris can't talk to us without turning the Zoom on. I know, we're not, I guess, doing that tonight. Jonathan set it up, no Zoom. Because uh, of the, it's been- But we have it posted as hybrid, Carol. Casey, I don't have anything to do with this. This is the way it was set up. For them, but for us, we have to do Zoom. Well, go ahead and log it in. I know why he's probably doing it, but. Yeah. Um, this I'm way, sorry, it's not gonna, it's not, it's not, yeah. It, just, just, talk, just start we, it. We can't talk to Chris. Yeah, just start it. So. Just start, okay. So anyway, welcome. Um, we're going to, um, skip over public comment right at the moment and put that on later because we have with us tonight John Pachorek, Chief of Police in the town of Deerfield that's going to give us a uh, road update. Okay, John. Thanks so much, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I know we had a recent vote for the override. I appreciate everybody voting. Uh, so met with uh, Kevin Scarborough earlier today, yesterday, uh, as well as Monday the two roads that we still have closed in the town are Depot Road and McClellan Farm Road. Uh, Depot Road is a cut through road behind Richardson's Candy Kitchen over to Pine Nook Road near the underpass. Uh, the entire side of the bank is washed out over there from uh, storm damage and it is a probably a 40 plus foot drop off and it's right over into the pavement of the roadway so it's just not safe. We did have to barricade that off. McClellan Farm Road is uh, washed off near the Greenfield end on the north side. It actually goes right down to the Connecticut River and that area washed out is probably 50 feet long, but it drops down 70 to 80 feet. So to backfill that is uh, gonna be a massive feat. So we're gonna have to look into that in the future and see what we can do for a cost-effective solution. So Kevin and I reviewed uh, our original storm damage reports, which we had over 100 different locations in town and we whittled it down to what's left to be done under emergency and then what we would actually classify more as long-term work so what we still have listed as an emergency starting on the top left would be broughton's pond road broughton's pond road is off of old main street it's at the north end of uh, old main and it goes out to the old deerfield sewer treatment plant it's a secondary access road for emergency evacuation for deerfield academy the actual pipe that goes under the road from one side of the pond to the other side of the pond of drainage is totally collapsed. Thankfully, Sammy Yaswinski's cleared it out multiple times in the past years. He cleaned it out about two to four weeks ago for me, but it has literally failed again. The, uh, the height on the north side is back up about 18 to 24 inches from where he did have it. So we do have to get in there and, uh, and get that pipe done and get that equalized because every time we get rain, the water's coming over the road. There's a major power line that goes out there for the old Deer, Deerfield sewer treatment plant that we don't want that water sitting within that water, or within that electrical line height. Child's Cross, we have a culvert over there that's a 48 inch old box culvert that's collapsed. Uh, the head wall on the south side needs to be taken care of. So um, that's old infrastructure, it needs to be replaced. Basic estimate on it right now is $50,000. I think that's a tad bit high. Broughton's Pond Road was $15,000. I think all these are a tad bit high to allow some slight flex flexibility. The big variable right now, as we know, is Hawks Road. Hawks Road is off an of upper road in, in West Deerfield. It is a dirt road and the first part of it is paved, but the road is primarily dirt. And we saw such massive storm damage there that Friday, myself, Kevin, and Mike Morosky, uh, one of our amazing Recording in progress. are gonna go up there and uh, we're actually gonna tour the whole area. We're gonna look at what the problems are, what they've been identified as, where the water's supposed to go, and see what cost-effective solutions we can apply up there, at which point I can give the board a greater estimate on that. So Hawks Road is, is a variable right now of how much we do to stabilize that road and then towards the Shelburne line, the actual west side of Hawks Road is more of a long-term fix. So we would go up to the last house on the road, initially with the emergency storm damage, and then beyond that, all the way over to the Shelburne line would be more on the long-term fix. 
Matthews Road, we did uh, extensive work on that within the first 36 hours after the storm to get that open so Conway people had emergency access back up to their homes. Uh, one of the pipes up there, one of the culverts is undersized. It is collapsed in the middle. It's a pretty deep culvert. It's down approximately 25 feet, so we need the larger excavator that Mike has. Not a big deal, but it is a two to three day job just because of the depth of it. Digging down, trucking the material off site, putting a larger pipe in there because it does back up. That's a choke point for the water. So that's just estimated right now at 30,000. Um, hopefully that's a tad bit high as well. Steam Mill Road, we still have a, a collapsed pipe up there that we do need to take care of with some side drainage work. The board was aware of that um, last fall during the storm damage. I think you guys had previously authorized that work as that had been run by town council as well at the time. Waitley Road, uh, we have a collapsed inlet and culvert down there pipe that we've kind of just been delaying because it's trickling little by little, but that really needs to be replaced before we get more massive rain and it just literally takes the road with it. Mill Village at Boynton, for all those folks in South Deerfield that go to the dump after a good rainstorm, you will recognize this right away. When you cross off of North Main Street, you go over 5 and 10 and you head out Mill Village. You go past Plain Road on your left where Yankee Candle's old distribution center was. You keep going down past the condos and on your left is Boynton Road where there's more condos. So that's called Boynton Road East. Right at the intersection of Boynton Road East and Mill Village Road, there is a culvert that runs from your right to your left. If you look Anytime the water on the right hand side of the road, the east side of the road is pretty much at road surface level. It's within about three inches of the road all the time. That pipe is collapsed in there. It does allow some flow during the storms, but that water comes right across the road. We have highway there after any major rainstorm, uh, basically plowing with the bucket loader, the mud out of the road. And like I said, anybody that's been through there on a Saturday headed up to the dump will immediately recognize that and go, oh yeah, I know what they're talking about. So in total, I just threw in here for budgetary estimates right now, a miscellaneous line item in case something pops up that the select board needs to authorize um, in the future, $50,000. We're looking at, in for everything we've done to date, an additional about $220,000, which includes the $50,000 miscellaneous. I actually think that when we factor Hawks Road in here, that hopefully will actually come close to this 220 anyways. River Road, in the last seven days, we put in seven days of work. We rented a 60-foot boom excavator, and we restabilized all three banks that we were concerned about. We finished 526 River Road on the north side and the south side. For the residents that have driven through there, I'm sure they've noticed the extensive work. We dug out the soil. We went down to gravel, to hard soil, where there was actually rock and gravel in the ground. And we backfilled it with large rock at the base. We then laid uh, landscaping fabric and drainage fabric all over the top of it. And then put large stone to smaller stone over the top of that. So the water is controlled. Those banks are restabilized. All three locations are okay. I've got to talk to Kevin about getting some minor guardrails in there and we should be good and out of there. We're just estimating that right now at about 45,000. I think that's a tad bit high, but I think it's within probably five to 7,000 of the ballpark number. Um, so, have you included the 680 River Road, the head wall failure? Uh, that's actually a tail wall. Yep, and we do need to add some uh, some stone in there. The head wall actually looks all right. I did stop and look at okay. that. So, I so you did? Yeah, okay. I did take a peek at it. Yeah, it's right on the corner of Yellow Farm Road. That's right on yeah, Lynn's back, yeah. Yep, so um, I'll talk to Kevin about that. We also need to do some minor excavating on the side of the road because the water's not going where it should be, but that's all minor. So to date, just for the residents, we have spent $2.067 million, $2 million, $67,000. We're waiting for about $45,000 worth of invoices from River Road for the past seven days. Like I said, hopefully that's slightly less. The work to be done, including the $50,000 miscellaneous, is $220,000. That leaves us currently at $2.332 million. I had to put my reading glasses on. Sorry for the delay. So. 
the big variable right now that we're just waiting to see Friday um, when we meet is what we do with Hawks Road, how extensive we get, how the most cost of effective way we can get out of there while stabilizing that road where we're not in there during the next major storm yet again. So that's our big variable right now. Uh, the projection is again the 2.332 million. We know thanks to Senator Comerford and Representative Blay, uh, the Healy administration, we are going to receive $1.58 million of state assistance, which is massive. So right now, um, that's, that's the roads that need immediate work. Now let's talk about long-term work. Long-term work, we have Foxtown Road. That's off of Hawks Road up in Old Deerfield. We got a couple of culverts to put in on up there. Uh, we do have probably 12 to 24 inch deep ruts up there. And we do need to do some minor work on that road, but that's more a long-term fix. There's not a house affected by that right now. McClellan Farm Road is a long-term fix. That road remains closed. As I mentioned earlier, it's about 50 feet long, but it's 70 to 80 feet deep, and it goes right down to the Connecticut River. Hawks Road over to the west side. Hawks Road to the west side is a long-term work and project. That's all the way over to the Shelburne line. Rice's Ferry Road is a long-term fix. That's from River Road up to the backside of Eagle Brook. It goes through the woods. Most people don't even realize it's a road, but it actually is a town road, and it suffered two to three foot um, storm damage debris up and down it. Yep, so we do have some work to do there. That's gonna be a long-term project. And the last one is Little Meadow Road. I did talk to, uh, to Skippy Yaswinski today about the possibility of stockpiling large rock out there and doing 90-foot uh, fixes as the emergencies present themselves. And what we would do is actually have Mike come back in, Mike Morosky. We would rent that 60-foot boom excavator. We would stockpile the six four by six-foot rocks and we actually, depending on when we needed to do those emergencies, we would actually just go in 90 foot sections and do what we needed to do under an emergency authorization if they would allow it. So that way you're not worried about any time delay, you're not trucking material in, you're just pre-stockpiling emergency storm debris for any location necessary. And I think that's the most cost effective approach. So that's it, we still got the two roads closed. We got Depot and McClellan Farm Road closed. We talked about the long-term projects. We talked about what still needs to be done under emergency. We know uh, Hawks Road is the huge variable right now. And I don't have a better answer for you until Kevin, myself, and Mike Morosky walk that Friday. I know Zach from Ty and Bond is also involved. And we'll kind of see forward from there and I'll keep the board in the loop as we go forward. Yeah, happy to answer any questions. Uh, no, John, that's fine. I am so appreciative of you um, summarizing this. I have sat in on a couple um, briefings this week for pre-RFRs. Um, maybe Hawks Road would fit into the DER, Division of Ecological Re Restoration Grant. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a possibility. Um, if there's enough, you know, um, endangered species or something like that mm -hmm. up there. You know we weren't able to do that at Mill Village, but um, we have to solve, on the paved part of Hawks Road, we have to solve whether we're gonna build up or blast. Mm -hmm. And then on the dirt road part, when we do restoration work, I really would wanna try to get that fabric in there that they do on the Vermont standards for dirt roads, mm -hmm. so that we don't have to keep readdressing this part of Hawks Road. Mm -hmm. So. Just keep that in mind, and maybe we can figure out, you know, some grant funding for that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, we can you. always look at tar and stone. There's yeah. a, there's a few different options that's less expensive than pavement and would actually stabilize the road. Mm -hmm. So I think there's some few options out there that I want to run by Mike Morosky and say, hey, what about this? What about this? What about this? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we can do some hard pack or something that uh, compacts really well and s sort of binds well together. Sure. I'm, I, I'm really relieved that you're looking at um, looking at that on Friday because um, I have been really concerned. When I went up there and looked after the storm damage from December 18th storm, uh, it was so narrow. I mean, see, you're more educated than I am because you actually jumped in a truck with Kevin. I went up to Hawks Road, but I haven't actually sat with Kevin and walked it and actually physically picked his brain to say, okay, where's the damage? 
What are you looking at? Where's the problem with the water? Where are we going with this? What are you trying to do? And then put Mike in the middle of it and go, okay, what's the most cost effective approach? Well, it was so narrow after the five point five and a quarter inch rain that we had on um, that 18th yes. of December. Oh yeah, it's yep. it's. I don't even know how a plow gets up there and back. But Truth Pine Nook and Wapping Road looked like nothing happened. I know, I know. I'm you so relieved. <laughs> I'm, I just want you to know it's wonderful, wonderful. So. Yeah, it's been great. And uh, two things I want to reiterate: this is the first chance we've had to communicate to the town that how thrilled we are about the 1.58 million in disaster relief it's going to make all the difference and also i want to thank you for continuing to take me out on tours and you know look at the work that's in progress and see that you know the quality jobs that are are being done at very low expense so um i'm really pleased that uh, we've had you as the emd and helping you know you and kevin pulling this all together for us I, I think people just don't realize. I mean, when you talk about over a hundred locations of damage, people just that's such a, people just can't grasp it. And and the fact if you start on um, Matthews Road and work your way to River Road, it's four and a half hours driving to view all the damaged spots. I mean, Kevin and I have done this multiple times um, since July, mm -hmm. and it, it's it's. When you take people out, like our legislators, our senators, I mean, people have come, but it's the time involved to tour the damage is just unbelievable. And people just, I don't think they understand that. And I, again, I want to thank you and Kevin for all the hundreds of hours of work. And I know John Davis is here. Um, the old Main Street was uh, threatened you know, mm -hmm. with the backup of water and having that addressed um, and having it flowing is absolutely <coughs> amazing. It, you know, our whole street really, f with the rain that has happened since July, would have been underwater if you hadn't addressed that. So again, thank you so very much. And I just don't think people understand the extent of the damage. So I also just want to thank Chris Miller um, and the rest of the DPW staff. They have been working to do this and, and Kevin's got his hand up so I just wanted to give him a chance to chime in yes Kevin I'm sorry I didn't see your hand uh, uh, no worries hey um just a real quickie uh and again um you know John John's hit everything on the head the only one I want to give you a quick up on is Ox Road what I did was I reached out to Zach and Tyne Bond again and said look you know I I need more of of a design plan compared to the overall of what they originally were going to try and put to go do those two different companies them and in, in, in beta so long story short i was like look i says either we need to raise the road or we need to drill and blast personally myself i think it's going to be easier to raise the road because in that way your drilling and blasting will, will be reduced because you're going to have to drill and blast or hold ram or do something to be able to get your drainage down the edge of the road he goes the only thing he may want to look at for a calculation would be the volume of of the volume, the volume and the velocity of the water that's going underneath, which is all part of a pre-established drainage system system. It, it all goes down to the bottom of the hill. <clears throat> Excuse me, once it hits the bottom of the hill, it's part of a system. So all we're doing is we're just directing that water to that one place. Okay. Um, and again, you know, uh, again, the best thing, my opinion would be to raise the road um he's going to go ahead and he's going to try and go ahead and put together a couple different numbers for us um but i told him i was like you know i said this this we're going to try and do very similar to like what we've been doing is do what we can and save ourselves tens of thousands of dollars um and he said hey i he's i completely understand so i told him i was like look i said the stuff that you already looked at you know the 717 river road the 526 north and south those for the most part have been stabilized so you know, now you need to look at your bigger picture that you were looking at. The three-sided three box culvert and this and that, the other thing for the one over there by, by Dumas's. Um, so long story short is, is, is he is trying to put together something that's going to give us a little bit better handle or, or more educated decision on what to do with Hawks. Um, but again, I think raising the road is going to be the easiest and the cheapest. Um, because otherwise, you know, like I said, drilling and blasting is not cheap, and neither is whole ramp. 
<laughs> but again, they're you know they Kevin, they're um, engineers. I'll let them make the decision. So Kevin, the other thing that I would would like you to ha have him look at is River Road. W knowing that we have a million dollar cap, how did we section off River Road? What we have to prioritize the sections for long term fixes. So yeah, that that that's what he was trying to do originally, and I said no, no. I said that's all fine and well. I says I need engineering to fix something. I'm not looking for the big picture, which right. is what you were looking at. Right. This is what I need. I need to fix now. What you're looking at is one to three to five to 10 years down the road. Yeah. It's I'm looking at the next six months is all I'm concerned about right now. Right. So I just want you to make sure that we have to keep having that conversation because that's oh, oh he's already got the plan put together. I, oh, I thought okay. it was already forwarded over to you guys. It's like one hundred and forty thousand dollars worth of engineering fees. All right. Well, so I, I will I will make sure that that gets forwarded over to you again uh, to make sure everybody gets an opportunity to see it, what the scope of work is in the whole nine yards. But right. similar to what you're looking for, that's the one hundred and forty grand. All right. So when you can get it over here, then we'll have to yeah, schedule I can it. do that tomorrow. All right, then maybe what we'll do is we'll do it for um, our next meeting. Is that yep. right with you? I'm with me. Okay, Casey, can you put it on River Road for the next meeting? Yep. Because we're gonna have to have some strategy on that. Okay. Oh yeah, no, no doubt. Plus, they're only one of two. I know. You know, because you asked for two different people, the second people have not responded yet. I know. So. Well, we haven't we haven't paid out any money to them so well exactly but what i'm getting at is is, is you know if you've got crappy service now you're going to get crappy service later that's my opinion oh uh, no i agree i agree so mm -hmm. i'm it's whatever anyway right. thank you Kevin. i mean hey, you know we're going to open our doors to make sure that we get the opportunity to make sure we're not getting it uh, uh, taken advantage of by another company financially um but again the bottom line is is you know if i get ghosted then you know why are we even bothering dealing with these people so i know i agree i agree maybe we can get another another engineer um anyway thank you kevin so that that's that's pretty much all i got so um yeah like and, and thank you john you know john john's obviously done a phenomenal job as um emergency director it's it just taking so much heat off of me which has been great. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you. All right. Thank you for thank you. Time. Yeah, thanks, yes. Kevin. Dynamic duo. Yeah, yeah really. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Kevin and I work very well together. Yes. Um, John, yeah. is there anything else you want to say? No, I think I'm good. Yeah, um, yeah. You guys have any questions for me? No, no, no. no it's Kevin just... and I will follow up after we uh, we kind of peek at Hawks Road and see what our options are and yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll bring it, we'll put, we'll, actually we'll put on Hawks Road and River Road. You want Hawks Road and River Road? Yeah, because we need, we'll have to be able to discuss it as a board. And and if, Kevin, if, if you can be on to the next meeting, I think it's uh, February 7th, okay? Yep. We'll put you on for like right at six. Good. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Chief. Thank yeah. you. And I will be here Thanks, at John. 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Yes. Oh, thank you, John. Yes. I think so you it, will may be, want to that. it will be actually a really eye opening, I think. I mean, it will be helpful. Yeah. Bye bye. See you guys. Good night. Good bye. night, John. Thank you. John, I think we're ready for you. Just you need to introduce yourself for people that are in our audience. And uh, we're so glad you came. Thanks, John. Thanks so much, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm John Davis, I'm the president of Historic Deerfield, and I'm here to uh, ask permission of the town to install some historic markers on town property. Historic Deerfield has partnered with the Witness Stones Foundation, which is based in Guilford, Connecticut. And this is a foundation that is hoping to make visually manifest the history of slavery in New England in the 17th and 18th centuries by uh, putting in place witness stones. They're not actually stones, they're four by four bronze plaques that are set into the ground that mark the location of the residence of enslaved peoples in the 17th and 18th century. 
Um, they are now in five states. Uh, Historic Deerfield was the first and I think still only Massachusetts site for the witness stones. And we are in a way, Deerfield that is, um, a standout location for the witness stones because Deerfield is the best documented small town in North America, basically. And so we know more about that part of our history than most towns do. And so there are many more individuals whom we have researched that we know about here in Deerfield. So we um, uh, approach this project in two stages. The first stage, which has already been accomplished, is that we installed witness stones on the properties along Old Main Street that are owned by Historic Deerfield. There are 11 sites and 19 markers that are in place. What we would like to do this year is complete that project by installing 14 more stones for 14 more enslaved individuals on seven different sites on land that we do not own. The majority of those sites are owned by Deerfield Academy and they have already agreed to uh, installing witness stones. There's one stone that we uh, hope to install on the property owned by the Brick Church. And then the one other site, which will have the largest number of stones, is the proposed site that would be on the town green. Um, the reason that we, want to, uh, that we need to do it there is that these are the markers for seven enslaved people who were owned by the first town minister in Deerfield, John Williams and his son, Elijah Williams. The minister's lot that was given to the minister by the town overlaps the town green. Uh, and we like to put the stones as close to the actual location as possible, even if the house is no longer there. And you can see on your sheet that we've divided them into um, four stones on the left and three on the right. Four enslaved people owned by John Williams. Remember, he was the, the minister taken in the raid of 1704. Two of those individuals, um, Parthena and Frank, were actually killed in the raid, which we would you know, uh, highlight in the stones. And then uh, after his death, his house was inherited by his son Elijah, and those are the three individuals on the right. Historic Deerfield would pay for the fabrication of these markers, and we would um, uh, uh, see to their upkeep annually. They need to be polished and cleaned, and if we were successful in getting your permission, um, we would be able, in the end, to document 33 Deerfield residents who lived here under slavery, the most that any location has ever been able to document. Um, John, that's wonderful. Um, I'm totally in favor of it. Absolutely, and I, I think it's actually um, quite appropriate that um, we have another marker of a historic event, the, the, uh, the Civil War soldier in the background uh, pointing to the long history that America has and, and the complexities of relationships with race. And, and so it's a, it's a great thing. Well, thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm very supportive. So um, I would make a motion to support um, this activity. And I'll second that. Um, is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Um, John, I, I'm, I'm very supportive. I, I'm very appreciative. And I also, um, it's very clear to me that, um, you know, always maintenance is an issue because we never have in the town have a budget for maintenance. So having you maintain these is wonderful because it's, you know, just from respect, but also the fact that, you know, if it was our responsibility, we wouldn't be able to do it, I'd have to say. This would be low on the priority list. So um, it's wonderful you're offering um, to maintain them. Um, I'm sure Casey can, you know, have some kind of um, document just to verify that it's your responsibility, and um, we can move forward on Great. this. Great. Thank you so much. I, I know that's uh, fine. I'm, I and think as I wonderful. mentioned when I wrote an uh, email in response to this, my wife and I walk by the stones. We, we, we like that side of the street because the, the sidewalks are better. 
Um, and uh, we've also brought many of our visitors to see them because it's quite unusual. So uh, you're doing great work. Thank you. Yeah. Just so you know, we will we we had a ceremony to dedicate the first set of stones. We're planning a second ceremony, which uh, and we hope to install the stones in September. And we wanted to wait until the Deerfield Academy student body was back and perhaps the students at other schools so that they might attend that ceremony. And we'll certainly let you know when we schedule that. Oh, that would be great. wonderful. That thank would be you. great. Okay. Yeah. And thank you, John. I thank you. Um, just signed up for your new series that you're having this, win this winter on the uh, uh, witches, the you know, lesser known witches of New England. So Witchcraft is a fascinating topic. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> so anyway, well, thank you for again. doing so much. Have thank a good you. night. Okay. Um, we'll have public comment going back to our regular agenda. Um, public comment? Is there any public comment? Okay. Uh, moving Anybody on. online? Anyone? Well, I didn't look like there was any. No. No hands. Um, okay. Select board announcements. Did you have any announcements, Tim? Um, we are just awaiting um, notification of whether we're going to receive the heat grant for a deep pit test well to explore the possibility for geothermal. Uh, in the town campus area, uh, not far from the town hall. We're supposed to note here by the end of January, so keeping our fingers crossed, it would be a $50,000 grant to do this, and it would let us know whether it's a possibility for the town to consider going forward. Um, obviously, we'd be looking to fund it through state and federal grants, but there's a tremendous interest in trying to move away from fossil fuels. It's part of the governor's uh, 2050 plan, and uh, we know that the local uh, colleges and universities are doing a lot of work around this technology, so we we'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, we had a very successful MMA conference this weekend. Um, everybody was exhausted from working really hard, um, but we were very successful um, in connecting with a lot of our state agencies face to face, which really helps us. Um, especially when we ask for waivers and special consideration and explain our situation. Um, and I think it was very helpful. Uh, that's one of the reasons we were able to get the funding that we did because we've been successful telling our story. And we're going to keep working. Uh, I connected with Lemonster. Lemonster filed their final paperwork December 11th for their FEMA claim. They haven't heard back. Um, so I'm assuming, because the FEMA process is so slow, that they won't see any money if they get approved for two or three years. So there'll be some bridging money available. And um, by connecting with Lemonster and talking with them, they're willing to work with us. And um, so hopefully we'll be able to get another uh, round of funding towards our emergency expenditures. And so that was very productive to have um, that meeting. And we also spread out and uh, took various seminars about important topics that uh, Deerfield's concerned about. Of course, climate uh, effects of um, new types of storms uh, and how to, how to mitigate the, uh, the effects. And um, we also had an opportunity to connect with our new mayor from Greenfield. So uh, we've begun a conversation about a number of issues that we'll, we'll follow through with in the coming months. Yes, and that has to do with um, uh, especially ambulance response to Greenfield. So that has financial implications by a lot, but also the, just the future partnerships. Um, working with Greenfield is very advantageous for us because we are not really eligible for some, for quite a lot of grants. So working with regionally with partners like Montague and Greenfield, as we have successfully for the like the Public Health Excellent Grant. Um, will really help us. So um, we're looking forward to that. All right, uh, Board of Health, um, I would just say COVID and flu is certainly circulating. Please take any opportunity you have to um, get your shot. You can still take your have time for that, okay? 
And um, so the next item on the agenda is the minutes of January 10th. Just digging down to try and find them. So, um, let's see. This is MVP. I've got to get a better system of, do you know where they are? Um, I, I read them. I didn't have any problem, but okay, I don't know where no, they so, are because we just so got So I'll the just make packet. a motion to approve the, the minutes of the January 10th, 2024 meeting. Um, I will second that. So if there is no other discussion, all those in favor? Tim LG, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Okay. Um, we still have a few minutes, although, um, I mean, we could do, we could have Chris come up now. Oh, okay. All right. We'll, we'll just continue on then. Um, the next item on the agenda is a change order number 14 for um, wastewater treatment plant. This is for review and final approval. Um, this is actually... Do you want me to give you the breakdown? I have yes. the breakdown. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Trevor was, was so say, awesome. He gave it to Trevor, me. Trevor had spoken um, to me about it this week. Yeah, so we have... A plumbing, plumbing work in the aeration tanks for $13,838.74. We've got site drainage modifications for $62,546.84. We've got a lawnmower gate for $1,438.95. Headworks portable water line, PRV, I'm not sure what the acronym means, um, for $1,322.55. We have a stop gate lift system for $1,823.42. We have keypad bollards for $3,312.79. And then they have the DO nitrates probes credit, which is a credit of $15,825.20. That gives us a total of $68,458.09. And the question I have based on my conversation with Trevor was will the board um, if they approve this consider authorizing me to sign since Trevor's not here so I can turn this over faster um because I can do it electronically okay I do that with our applications and with our reporting all right um then I will make a motion to authorize you to sign um, and approve the, the um, change orders yeah, as, no. as listed. And I'll second that. All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Thank you, Casey. Oh, you're welcome. Um, then uh, next item is DPC Asset Management Grant. Um, the only I think thing Trevor I wanted to put a hold on that. Yeah, well, the only thing I just wanted to make, I mean, we're we're trying to watch what we're spending i just was there a match for this it wasn't clear that was me. the reason that trevor wanted to hold on it we were trying to figure out if there was a match and he and i haven't discerned whether that's the okay, case because there was a question in my mind it, it sounded like there was a match truth yeah to that's what we both think but we're not sure what that match okay. looks like um or if it's stuff that we're already doing um uh could that be the match? That was where I was trying to figure that out. Well, is, that not, was the not, thing. Is, not only just the dollar amount, mm -hmm. but since all the upgrading work that we have been doing in the recent months, because um, you usually are allowed to within the year um, make a make a put is, your match it, together. Yeah, that might be an in kind match. I, I just wasn't sure. Me so either. I, so that's I think okay. that was the reason he wanted to put it on hold. Okay, so let's just put this on the agenda for next week. I mean, okay. the next meeting on February 7th, okay? Okay. Casey, um, you don't need to print, print out any more stuff. I'll just hold this. But um, if there was some question of, of the match, uh, if you come up with more information, you could send that well, to that's us. What I would, that's what I was going to okay. try to do is work with Trevor when he gets back I'm, so we can I'm figure okay it out. I'm okay with all this. Um, yeah, we should have a management. We're going to have brand new plants by the time we're done. You know, I both. think so. so I it, think that's, it makes, if, if we decide to take the grant, he was a little reticent about that. 
So I don't know how he's going to feel about it. Um, yeah, but that's why I, I think the match might be something that we could already have been doing. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, yes. So we'll count. Because usually you can go back within, if it's within a year, you can count that activity. Oh, and count your, oh, okay. As in-kind match. Because we do, we're doing all this upgrading on the South Deerfield, yeah. and then we're going to be yeah. doing work on Old Deerfield. So somewhere along the line, that should count as in kind. We have the ability to do that if, there, if a match is required. And we're not finished doing the work. And so. we're not finished doing the work, right. So when we accept this grant, it's work that we are still doing. Okay. I guess we've discussed that enough. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. So it's on hold. Um, is Chris ready? Casey? We're working on this. Okay. We're All right. Um, can we? Can we? Uh, talk to Chris about charge point. Yes, Chris. Sure, are you able to? Chris, while Chris and I do this. <laughs> oh. Okay. Other Chris. <laughs> Which Chris are you talking to? Nolan. Nolan. Okay. Uh, sure. So I'm happy to talk about ChargePoint now if you have a, f a couple of minutes. Yes, please. Yes. That okay. So um, ChargePoint, I have put together a recommendation for the board to adopt a rate of 30 cents per kilowatt hour for the existing EV charger that we have at the Leary lot, the 59 North Main Street station. Um, it is a lot more competitive with the area than the current 75 cents per kilowatt hour, which is turning people away, according to several vocal accounts I've heard, as well as multiple reviews on the ChargePoint website. Um, and through meeting with Brenda, it looks like that would be more than reasonable for uh, making sure that the electricity that we use isn't being far outpaced by the um, revenue, or really the other way around. Um, is what I meant to say. Mm -hmm. um, it, it will have the revenue we bring in from operating the charger make up for the electricity. Um, and if it doesn't, then it's really easy to change. I just need to go into the portal and change it. And I could do that simply by a board vote if we decide we want to change it in the future at all. Um, so does anybody have any questions about that? Yes, I, I had a question. I'm, I'm happy that you're finally addressing this or been able to address it. So now you have the ability to go in the portal at the direction of the select board with no hassles, right? That's Correct. Right. Okay. So, and the 30 cents that we're going to vote on right now is covers our costs to the best of your knowledge. Yes. Um, I met with Brenda about this last week. Um, and while we, th there's a little bit too much variation for us to do exact math on what we think would be the, the best possible number to cover costs, but Based on how easy it is to adjust the number, we're okay with doing a, a trial and error. If we find that this number doesn't work out for keeping our, our balance down, um, we will be back with another recommendation. Perfect. That's all I wanted to know. Do you have any and, questions? Um, yeah. Uh, just I carpooled with the select board member from Leiden, and Leiden has a 27 cents a kilowatt hour um, charge, and she's reported that they are actually making a slight profit. and. Uh, so just I think 30 is definitely in more in the, in the range it should be. And um, you know, as we progress on the EV charger thing at the Leary lot, I think it's going to end up needing to be as competitive as possible to have people stop in Deerfield rather than some other community. Because uh, we're, well we're well situated with 116 and 91. So it's, you know, going to be within a half mile of people who are on the highway needing to charge and it's going to be a good thing for Deerfield so thanks for the work on it Chris yes I, I also want to say thank you that so that you have access to the portal I appreciate that very much okay. absolutely yeah thank you for giving some direction on this because this I think is going to be a game changer for how much traffic we see at the existing station and also the the future ones right now the current one I can tell is not very popular and it's understandable because it's one of the most expensive ones you'll find anywhere. So bringing that down to 30 instead of the current 25, I think is, or the current 75 rather, I think is a much better option. 
Okay. So I will, uh, you I'll make, make a motion, motion to uh, authorize Chris to set the um, charging rate for the charge point um, charging stations at 30 cents a kilowatt hour. I will second that. All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Great. Um, are you guys ready to go yet? No, we're trying. Okay. Um, we can, uh, the Rural Affairs Director's request for the top three Deerfield priorities for approval. I have to say, um, I, I think she's talking about legislative priorities. Um, and I want for the minutes. Um, my first um, priority is um, an act to provide sustainable future for rural schools, which is Senate Bill 2388, House Bill 3567. 69% um, of our budget is related to school expenses, and that Senate bill is going to make the difference between us staying um, financially stable or not, because this, you know. The schools this year are um, able to do a lot to control their budgets, um, but some years they just don't have the ability. So that's a huge thing. My number, my second um, priority is Senate Bill 2506 and House Bill 4181. It's the act creating a state disaster relief fund for emergency management. We're just having these gap storms all the time. And when we talk about gap storms, we mean we're not eligible for FEMA, but we have millions and millions of dollars worth of damage. And uh, I mean, we just, you cannot budget for it. We do not budget for it. And um, we need help. And we need more timely help. It's, it's been really stressful waiting for the state to give us some state aid. We're hoping to get more, but it truly is not. Um, it's not easy. So, and Tim, did you have a? You you listed two. Yeah. I'm basically those are the two most important things uh, going forward that will make a substantial difference. Um, and this these we discussed this another thing we discussed at MMA was to try and set priorities for you know, what we wanted to hope to achieve with uh, Ann Gobi in the next year. So I think that's a pretty good starting point. Okay, so well, those two, and um, I have to say there, I mean, there are other things that we could talk about, uh, but, but it's those are two biggies. And we have a 645. Yeah. So, so we're going to move on or move back into the agenda. Um, so we have tonight uh, Chris Mason from the Department of Energy Resources. He's the climate leader communities program leader and um, and the energy committee a few members of the energy camp committee both online and here so welcome please introduce yourselves for our audience and um, that's online so you need to speak into the speaker right up here yeah uh, you have to get put your face yeah, right, right on top of it. it it is really so I, guess, I guess I'll start here. Excuse me, I have a little bit of a frog in my throat. And hopefully it won't interfere. Okay, so you're going to have to pull it closer. I can tell you that already. We're going to have people bugging us if we don't. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to move forward because it's buried under the rug here. Oh, oh that's <laughs> what it is. Yeah, it won't, it won't, it won't stay Hold this me, way. push you. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Now can everybody, everybody can oh, hear me. Oh, perfect. Much better. Much right. better. Well, Thanks, thank Casey. you. We just we just don't want people online not to be able to hear. Absolutely. Yes. Yowza. So I'm Chris Mason. I'm the um, Western Mass Regional Coordinator for the Department of I mean for the Green Communities Program. I'm with the Department of Energy Resources. Do you want the? <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. We have to have David and. Larry um, and M.A. talk to us, too. David Gilbert Keith, uh, Chair of the Energy Committee. Laurie Busada, Energy Committee. M.A. Swedland, Energy Committee. Welcome. You guys didn't go far since 4 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> since our 4 o'clock meeting. Okay. 
Do you guys want to put this in context or just this, um, this is an informal inf information session, correct? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Think, I think I'd rather put it in context after you give some information about it. But okay, sure. All right. I, so I don't think it matters. I was, I was asked to talk tonight on um, um, <clears throat> the Green Community's uh, Climate Leader Program. Uh, I have a few key slides here. I was asked to bring some handouts. So I'm going to bring some of these up here for you guys. I gave them to them. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I do. Wonderful. <clears throat> okay. Chris, I don't want to interrupt you, but I think people will understand better if they know that, because we're green communities. Yes. And this is Green Communities 2.0. Similarly, we are MVP community, and we're working on MVP 2.0. So this is the new rendition of two long-standing programs. So Pretty, go ahead. Clearly stated. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's confusing to people, I think. Right, OK. Um, well, I've got a presentation uh, if that would come up. Chris, I think you can run it if you want to. It's on my laptop? Chris Nolan. If, if it's oh, on your laptop, Chris, Chris Nolan's Nolan. giving you permission okay. to screen share. Or I can run it. it. It doesn't matter to me. Either one is fine. Sure. Why don't you run it right now? Okay. Just let me know when to change slides. Okay. As long as I can see the slides. You will be able to. All right. Yep. You'll see it. Beautiful. Okay. So Green Communities 2.0. <laughs> there we go. And yes, you guys are, uh, you guys are Green Communities already. Uh, next slide. So this is kind of an evolving program from the Green Communities uh, program. As you, that you, I'm, I'm just going to say this just to remind everybody. You became a Green Community by adopting as of right siting for renewable energy or alternative energy, um, uh, for either for generation, resource, and, and research and development, or manufacturing. You adopted expediting permitting process to make sure there was no hindrances in these kind of things moving forward. You created a clean energy reduction, an energy reduction plan to reduce energy use 20% in five years. <clears throat> and you're currently working on that very nicely. By the way, congratulations on your recent um, grant on EV chargers. <laughs> That's pretty exciting. <laughs> That's very exciting, yes. Um, uh, you implemented a policy to purchase only fuel efficient vehicles. And you are minimizing life cycle costs by adopting, you adopted the stretch energy code. Um, right now, the, um, uh, the state in general, utilities in general, we're moving from the idea of energy, you know, increased energy efficiency to actually have more of a direct focus on climate reduction, climate change, and greenhouse gas reductions. So the Climate Leaders Program is, kind of, is an evolution in that direction. Um, uh, in order to be qualify as a uh, climate leader, you'll need to establish or maintain a local committee to advise and coordinate and, and lead on energy climate activities. So perhaps you already have a committee here. Um, uh, you'll need to make a municipal decarbonization commitment. In a nutshell, that's saying you're going to commit to um, uh, s stop using fossil fuels by the year 2050. So the municipal buildings, and, uh, actually, and cars and stuff, too. Um, uh, you would need to create a municipal decarbonization roadmap, which kind of spells out how are you going to do that. Uh, so this is, you know, this is going to take a bit of work. It's going to take some capital improvements over a number of decades. So, so get, you start putting together a map on how you move forward. You would adopt, um, actually, at this point, you could touch the slide, next slide, a few times here. I know there's some arrows that are going to point. Yeah, one more time. So instead of purchasing just fuel efficient vehicles, the next one would be a zero, uh, zero, um, sorry, this is a zero emissions vehicle, ZEV, um, first vehicle policy. So <clears throat> you're gonna choose to buy, you would, you would adopt a policy to purchase electric vehicles, fuel cell vehicles if they're ever available, but zero emission vehicles uh, as a first choice. If they're not available, then you could, you know, you go down the hierarchy from there. And on top of the stretch code, you would adopt the specialized stretch code, which is a piece of, which is a piece of energy code that basically kind of tilts the playing field towards, um, uh, towards more electric houses and really decarbonized houses. Um, next slide. Uh, let's, okay. 
So the requirements for certification, this is kind of repeating them here. You have to be a green community in good standing. Um, need to establish the local committee. Need to commit to a municipal decarbonization by 2050. Need to formulate a roadmap for implementation. Adopt a zero emissions vehicle policy. And adopt a specialized stretch code. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, in this case, with the Climate Leaders Program, um, unlike the Green Communities Program, you'll be required to be recertified every three years. Um, and to do that, you demonstrate that you're still meeting the certif cert cert certification requirements. You would take time every three years to update your decarbonization roadmap. And you would implement one community engagement climate leader best practice. And I will get to those towards the end of the slideshow. But that means every three, with every three years you would be doing some kind of, when I say above and beyond, um, you know, one, probably things that Deerfield has already done. Mm -hmm. It could be like a solarized program, mm -hmm. something like that, some kind of a, um, a strong leadership program once every three years. Next slide. <clears throat> so what are the reasons to do this? <clears throat> uh, besides all of the uh, climate friendly uh, leadership um, uh, uh, examples that are showing. Um, right, uh, right now, the Green Communities Grant Program, you guys take advantage on a regular basis, is limited to a certain number of things you can apply for. Um, and like a number of communities have asked for us to you know, provide grants for PVs on municipal buildings, and we haven't done that. Um, um, but if you're a climate leader, you will get a broader array of um, uh, a larger menu to choose from for what to apply for. And this is a, a, a couple, this is a, a, a number of examples of what, you, what, what that might actually be. Uh, it says potential up there. We've definitely talked about these, what's, what's up on the board. But nothing's set in stone until it's finally, you know, finalized. Um, next slide. <clears throat> okay, so green community in good standing. You've submitted your annual report. You're still meeting the five criteria that we mentioned at the beginning and you have no active moratoriums on ground-mounted solar or battery energy storage. It's basically what you've been doing all along. Okay, next slide. Um, uh, so in this case, I don't think I have to go into this because you kind of have a team here already. I don't need to describe the different ways you can put together a team. It could be an outside, it could be a not-for-profit of some kind that you partner with, um, but there'll be a little bit of uh, requirements on identifying and. I'm verifying that this is the team you're working, working with. Next slide. <clears throat> so a decarbonization commitment. Uh, right now, you know, it says clean, clean energy climate resolution, whether it's from the town meeting, um, uh, whether it's in your climate action plan, if you've got a climate action plan, that spells it out. For some communities, there's a, the uh, Metro Mayor's Coalition Climate Mitigation Commitment, though, uh, the cities shown here happen to be part of that, so that actually does it. Um, but you, you do have to have some kind of resolution. Again, it's going to be basically being, say, in a nutshell, says we're going to stop using fossil fuels by 2050. That's what, you, that's what you're aiming for. And the idea there is as you shift away from fossil fuels and towards an electrified system to heat and cool to, uh, tra for transportation, the electric grid is going to be getting greener and greener as we go along. So by that, you're aiming for net zero by shifting in that direction. Okay, ne uh, next slide. <coughs> so, yes? In our town, we'd have to pass that at a town meeting? Uh, let's see, that was, um, yes, could be. The, the, the resolution? The resolution, yes. Oh. I believe so, yes. Um, I know like in Northampton, the mayor had a resolution uh, come out, but I think they would probably want the city council to, um, uh, to agree with that as well. So legislative body. I believe so. Meeting. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not gonna. You know, we'll leave it at that at the moment. And uh, if you if you are looking to get into this, we can clarify that. I might not be. It may. It might be able to be the select board. I'm not positive about that though. Okay. Uh, so zero over time. Here's what I was talking about right then. Um, so the roadmaps to use zero over time or approach. So they have. There's a, a link in this. Um, uh, the video which you guys, or the slideshow which you guys now have. 
best practices for achieving zero over time for building portfolios. Um, the decarbonization roadmap is going to take, you, you know, use triggering events, the end of life of HVAC equipment, a need for building, re 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 a building re I'm so sorry about this, building renovation, say if you have a roof, roof replacement, a building replacement, you know, those are the best times to implement, to, to take your buildings in a new direction. Um, <clears throat> um, and so the roadmap, you're going, you're, you're going to identify these things, plan them out in the future, so that as your capital improvements come along, you're ready and you can prepare yourself for it. Um, it may very well uh, include, you know, how do you, how do you phase this? What comes first, what comes second? That'll be spelled out in the roadmap. Next slide. Um, I can say here, for instance, um, this shows a bunch of items in a circle they don't really go in an ordered circle. This is showing that it's a kind of iterative. Uh, you may establish some low energy, uh, energy use intensity targets. You want to make sure your buildings get down to a certain amount of energy use per square foot um, because that's the, the first step in decarbonizing is to reduce your load, reduce the amount of energy you're actually using. So the next thing might be that you do some building envelope upgrades. Um, but you might not be able to do all of them because there, there might be something that gets in the way of doing one piece. Uh, that goes back to your energy intensity, um, and, and later on you're going to get maybe you're going to get to the windows in 20 years, um, whereas you didn't right away. Um, <clears throat> and then the low or zero carbon fuels for heating and cooling, uh, as you're ready and able to, you would then switch. It, that was more of a fuel switch. You're going to go from oil or natural gas or propane to an electrified system. So that's what the roadmap will entail, a number of things like that. Okay, next slide. Um, new construction. Non, so as you're building new buildings, non-fossil fuel heating and cooling, if possible, coupled with on-site renewables. Uh, if possible, implement energy storage wherever possible, a, a battery system of some kind. Um, prioritize sites that provide access to public transportation and alternative modes of transportation. These are all pretty solid strategies that communities are using already, and this, you're just going to put this into a decarbonization roadmap of some kind. Okay, next slide. Um, the first slide up here, reduce emissions from on-site fossil fuels. So as you, again, as you switch to electrifying, uh, as the grid gets cleaner, you see as the years go along in this, on this slide here, it shows the percentages dropping more and more. And by 2050, if the state is successful in its goals, <clears throat> our electric grid will be 100% renewable. And so if you have an electric uh, powered system, you will then be 100% renewable. Uh, so you're letting the efforts of the state drive down your, your greenhouse gas emissions by, the, by their mandates for the electric grid. Um, Light duty vehicles and heavy duty vehicles, you'd be looking at some kind of a uh, percentage of vehicles. This isn't so much percentage of miles driven, percentage of vehicles to get you there. Um, energy use intensity reduction, again, that's reducing the amount of energy any building needs so you can have a very efficient buildings is what you'd be committing to. Uh, next slide. So zero emission first vehicle policy. <clears throat> Priority one. Battery electric vehicles, if they're available. If not, then plug in hybrid electric. If not, hybrid electric. And if not, then the most fuel efficient internal combustion engine you can get. Um, so it's just a zero emissions uh, first vehicle policy. Okay, next slide. And then the adoption of the specialized code, which I said again, it's, um, and in a nutshell, what the specialized code does is it's, <clears throat> It says if you're building, if, if you're building an all electric building, it really is, there's no difference. The specialized code doesn't make any difference. If you're building one with some kind of a fossil fuel burning in the house or, the, or the, the business, then it needs to be wired for all electric sometime down the road because someone at some point is going to renovate that house for all electric. <clears throat> and it has to have PV. The size of the house depends on the size of the PV. Um, okay, next slide. I think that might be about it. Okay, well here's who's adopted the specialized building codes. And the next slide. 
So can you just go back just one second? I just have a quick question. Sure. That uh, map, are the blues or the whites or who Thank are you. the... Thank you very much. Okay. So the, uh, the whites are the, uh, towns that are still in the base code, the base energy code. The light blue are um, the towns that have adopted the stretch energy code. So Deerfield would be one of the light blues. And the darker blue ones are the ones that have now adopted on top of the stretch code, the specialized energy code. So that's Amherst and Northampton. Right. You can see in Western Mass so far it's Northampton and Amherst. Right. Thank you for... Yep. It just occurred to me there was some colors up there. Yeah. Right, 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 yes. Um, I just had a question. Are, are the state agencies on board? Because when we, we replaced the elementary school roof not too long ago, and we wanted to put um, solar panels on it, but we would have had to do some bracing or you know something that would hold the, the weight of the panels. And the school building authority wouldn't allow us to do that. And wouldn't fund, you know, grant, increase the MSBA? grant Here's to... MSBA? Right. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, as municipalities, especially mm -hmm. small towns like us, um, when we do have a grant from the state and state agencies, it, it seems like it would be very helpful if they were more supportive of this intentional program. Right. I, so I would, I I would add to that the <laughs> library. Yes, the library. We're building a new, a huge addition on our library, mm -hmm. and we can't get funding for solar. Okay, so their their energy use is going is going to shoot through the roof. It's I don't know. We estimate it was like thirty three hundred dollars uh, because of the exchange, and so we ourselves are putting on solar panels because we don't we can't take that kind Actually, of. Actually, I think it was thirty three thousand. Was it thirty three thousand? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was thirty three hundred no, a month annually. Oh, well, yeah. anyway, it was a horrendous amount of electricity cost to us as operational. So we, as a town, now are going to fund solar panels for that building. And, that, and the library wouldn't, library, um, wouldn't allow us to, you know, the so, so we, authority wouldn't allow us to fund those. I guess the base thing here is that the state, if, if they want to achieve their goals, they need mm -hmm. to align all their programs yeah. to allow these things to occur. MBLC right. doesn't, doesn't fund solar panels. So Massachusetts has a lot of regulations that they need to change that will allow us to make progress. Okay, I'll mention a few right now. <clears throat> MSBA, which Minnesota School Business Building Authority. Building Authority, thank you. Is no longer funding uh, fossil fuel improvements. Um, uh, so they have, they have made a big shift, and it, it's huge. So they will be funding air source heat pumps. I don't know in this case whether they would reinforce a roof for a solar array. Um, the idea of uh, coming to the green communities for a grant for solar, at the moment, if you apply for the next round, it's not going to be an option. But if you became a climate leader, that very well might be an option. Um, at the, um, <clears throat> uh, I'll say you can, you can see through the building codes, um, right now, historically, MassSave wouldn't give you money if you, to, if you were to build to code, um, because you're, you're building to code. Uh, at, and yet, at the moment, MassSave, because MassSave is going in the same direction, the Energy Efficiency, build, Energy Efficiency Advisory Council, which sets the three-year plans for MassSave, um, you know, through that, they're providing a $15,000 um, uh, incentive for building a house to a HERS rating that the code requires. Um, or if you go beyond that, you can actually get $25,000 towards it. So, so they're incentivizing building a house even to code. Um, there's a few things. If you guys are looking at putting solar in right now, I think you probably know this already, but I'll mention it just for the audience. You know, it's always historically, if you were a homeowner, you got 30% off on your tax. Oh, you got a 30% tax credit um, uh, for solar. <clears throat> but a municipality couldn't take advantage of that because you don't have a tax burden. That's no longer the case. Uh, with the Inf in, um, Inflation Reduction Act, um, municipalities can now get a tax rebate, a 30% rebate um, uh, through programs that the IRS has put up, put together. 
Uh, so things are leaning in the right direction, and the state is kind of coordinating its, move, its movements forward. It may not be perfect. No, but, but I'm, I'm giving the Healy administration a lot of credit um, because they're removing obstacles that existed a year ago, and so I'm, I'm really pleased to see that happening. Yeah, yes, yeah, things are really moving in the right direction. So part of this absolutely is, I mean, the whole fact that a climate leader, you're aiming for net zero by 2050, you're relying on the state to actually get to the goal that it put in, you know, you get to the, its own goal of reducing greenhouse gases from the electric grid. So part of this is obviously for any town, you set the goal, you can do what you can do, but you're going to have to rely on your partners, and the state is going to be a partner in this. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt your flow. That's okay. <laughs> right. No, I actually, I'd, I'd rather have, would have had a have conversation here. Okay, next slide. Um, as I mentioned, the best practice is recommended, so when you get recertified every three years, <clears throat> I'm not going to read through all of this, but uh, we're looking for climate leaders, we're looking for communities who would be willing to, you know, do a clean energy climate policy planning, some kind of in-depth planning, or some kind of community engagement uh, with equity considerations involved, or a clean transportation and mobility program. Uh, this could be like a solarized program. What else do we have out here? A youth outreach or education. Um, additional green zoning, perhaps. Uh, building benchmarks for performances, um, some kind of ordinance for um, you know, in your, your businesses to follow along. But some kind of outreach, you know, kind of going beyond the municipality, trying to work with the community um, on a three-year basis. We are participating in MVP 2.0. Nice. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, right. Yeah. Okay, and, and <laughs> last, we, I think uh, it's the can last. I, can I ask? Um, yes. Is, is the state planning on, on redoing the solarized program, or is there something equivalent? We never actually did solarize, right. but we, we've always been wanting to, but COVID mm. came along. Gotcha. Right, right. So uh, solarized was run by the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. Right. And I don't think they're, they're helping at the moment. Um, they gave a helping hand, but you don't need them to do it. The only, I mean, what they provided when they did that was they provided, you know, a couple thousand dollars for outreach right. money. So you would need to find some, some source of money for that. Um, they went through a selection process to find the installers, uh, which then means it gave the towns a little bit more um, uh, a surety, you know, they felt good about it because it was the state was helping them select the installers as well. But you don't need the state to do that. You don't need MESIC to do that. You can find the installers to work with. Um, and then you can still offer the same, and you know, once you're working with an installer, you can offer the right. same tiered, right. uh, tiered um, pricing. As it, so, so the community doesn't need to have MESIC. And we, could, we can use either green communities or this for coming up with that, with the initial right. money to, right. to, for yeah. the spreading the word and, and educating the population. Yes, so like a, if you became a climate leader and you had a broader array of things that you could be applying for, um, programs that are, you know, good programs that are run in your community, I think would almost certainly be one of the types of things you could apply for. Thanks. Yeah. I, I think a lot of the outreach that we're doing through the MVP 2.0 and um, or we'll be able to cover it. So um, I think that is a plus. We're going to do that anyway. So doing it for this is not going to be an issue. Nice. Um, I, I, I think that's a good comment. Um, also, Chris, mm -hmm. in, in the current um, Green Communities proposal, at least last year's, it does mention um, you could apply for funding to promote something like a solarized program. That, you think that will be think, in the current I, one? I think that was for specialized, uh, for the um, uh, special, special communities who have met certain criteria. They've, they've, they fit their 15% energy reduction for three years in a row. Oh, okay. There's I mean, certain communities that have met a few benchmarks, and they're allowed to have a smaller, kind of a broader array of things that they can apply for right now. Okay. Yeah. Um, is there anyone in our audience that has a question? Um, I know I can see Greg um, on, and uh, I, I think there was Margaret Nargowitz on, but um, before, I can't really How tell. many more slides do you have? Yeah. I think one. Oh, okay. Let's <laughs> finish up the slides, and then we can. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. 
Oh, okay. Actually, we, have, we do have more than one, but this is an important one. Okay. So that, um, the <clears throat> decarbonization roadmap, uh, right now we're going to be put $300,000 towards roadmap assistance, and that'll be through a program opportunity notice. It'll be a you know, competitive uh, grant application. That one's going to come out very soon. Um, and they're probably going to select communities that are showing some forward motion in this. Um, uh, but it's, it will be a grant of services, so there will be a consultant that would help you come up with a roadmap. And when you say three hundred thousand, is that for the whole state? Yeah, yeah. So it won't be it won't be all communities. We don't expect a lot of communities to move on this real fast. You know, it'll take time to kind of ramp up and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but for those communities that are <clears throat> ramped up or are ready to ramp up or moving forward already, um, there'll be uh, some. <clears throat> assistance to help you uh, develop that decarbonization roadmap. Uh, do we have to um, meet all the criteria before that? Beforehand, no. It's okay. kind of, Phew. that would be kind of a chicken okay. and egg type thing. Okay. <laughs> Great. I, I think we should, um, I mean, it's just my suggestion to the Energy Committee, but I think we should move forward on this um, as part of our, you know, a sideline to the MVP 2.0. So, mm -hmm. um, because we, we've learned by experience that when you're a first responder, you're more likely to get it funded than if you wait until year three when you're just <laughs> not competitive. <laughs> and, yeah. and honestly, um, it's our narrative to be on, on the cutting edge. We are the first in the state with the Healthy Soils Plan, and we're the first, we were first certified for MVP, and you know, on and on. We have a lot of, uh, we have a strong history, so. And we're pushing to be the first 2.0 in the state as well for MVP. So. Right. And of course, I'm your regional coordinator calling me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what's the next process for um, <laughs> establishing interest and getting into the pool for the 300,000? Um, the pond will be coming out soon on combines. Okay. And, and then it'll be spelled out in there is what one needs to happen. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So we'll watch for it. Yep. Just out of interest, because we've been talking all day about our next Green Communities Grant, is, oh, good. is the um, re-emphasis on carbon over energy applicable to the old green communities? It, it has been. Um, Great. Uh, I mean, it, it's been... One, two. I, I haven't, you know, been with the program except for about the last year. But um, uh, it looks at the cost per MMBTU reduction, so cost mm -hmm. for energy savings. But it also looks at cost per carbon reduction. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, the right. idea of decarbonization is looked on very. Because it could be a big part of our yeah. Okay. So, yeah. um, the roadmap assi assistance is that. Um, something that comes through like FERCOG and, and that grant goes to them or is that something that you, the DOER will be offering that assistance so somebody would work with us? DOER would be offering that and, okay. and it, would be, it would be a firm that they, they contract with. So it would be someone that they contract with will be providing services. Okay. Yeah. I, I guess the other thing that um, we heard that you would help with is the, um, the specialized stretch code would need to be adopted by a town meeting, is that? Mm -hmm. Yes. And you might make a presentation? Yes, um, I, could, I could make a presentation. And okay. we could have um, uh, someone from one of the firms that does code training, we could have someone from that uh, firm with us at the same time. Okay. Um, and if you wanted to do that, I would suggest that we kind of have a conversation um, with the prime um, um, decision makers uh, just to kind of set the stage, uh, getting the idea of what kind of information we want to have ready for, for Deerfield, and then set a time for a public hearing. Uh, and do you think, or a hearing, however you guys feel is appropriate? Do you think um, we would have anything to learn from Northampton or Amherst? Any case studies that they could share? I mean, it's always helpful when there's a local town. That's I saw the case studies on the um, on the website with the specialized dredge code, but I don't know. it can't hurt to talk to them. Yeah. I mean, they, they just went ahead. I, I wasn't involved with them, so. Okay. Yep. Casey Warner. Yeah, I'm, see, I'm seeing scowls over here. <laughs> no, no, it's not a scowl, it's a question. Um, so what would be really helpful is an outline from you of what all of this entails, because 
depending on the time frame, um, there's a lot of elements that go into this. There's a hearing process that the town has to hold. Mm -hmm. There's an information sort of dissemination process for everybody so they understand what it is. Um, and there's the planning board has a whole process that they have to go through. Plus, we have a tracking element for to receive approval from the attorney general's office. So this isn't a small um, project. No. Um, so we would need a lot more information so that we could set that set the stage for it to be successful because that support comes through folks that I work with here. So, so part of the roadmap might be. If we were going to adopt a stretch code, we could explore all of the elements that we need to achieve in order to do that. Is, and what or they is mean. that not? So I think the I think the um, the specialized code. Are, Casey, so are you are you referring to the specialized code, or are you yeah. referring to the entire package? The specialized code. Specialized. We've already adopted the old stretch code. We had adopted. Yes. This would be another major change in our zoning bylaws. So we need the background, the, the template for that, but we also need the context of how it's going to affect things. So when you say stakeholders, I'm assuming you're meeting you're meaning like the building commissioner, sure. the zoning and planning board, conservation commission, and anybody that has authority over sort of land because that's gonna have an effect depending on how this gets written into our bylaws. And is the stretch the, the specialized code affects every building including what houses that are built, right? Or does it just apply to municipal? Uh, no, no, specialized code actually it, it doesn't apply to um, renovations and additions. It only applies to new, new construction. Build, new construction. Right. New construction. So, as, yep. to, to further that question, so if I want to build a new house and, and we adopted the specialized code, the new house would be covered by that. Yes. Thank you. Also, commercial. Yes. At the same time. Yes, so, because like actually, um, sometimes they're separated. Uh, no, this would be the same time. Um, uh, yes, it would also affect commercial. And the carrot. <laughs> um, you, if we do adopt these things, we have a bigger menu of things we can apply to get help with, mm -hmm. including solar. Do we have any idea of amounts of that? We don't. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and Fair also, enough. Uh, thank you. <laughs> geothermal is also possible, and we are our town campus planning has been trying to yeah, very ambitious work on the feasibility for that. So right. that, you know, once we figure out that we it would make sense, the missing link would be okay. How do we fund it? So that's why I think we are super motivated to move forward on this. Um, I, 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 I think it's unrealistic to do it for this town meeting, but we have the fall town meeting and, and then the, or next year's spring town meeting mm -hmm. that we should be gearing. You know, you want to back into that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, you, we would open the warrant sometime in the August, beginning of September and close it, you know, usually having an end of October fall meeting. Mm -hmm. um, the warrant opens you know, in January of next year. We close it sometime in February, March, beginning of March, depending on what we have to do um, for the spring meeting. So from those date, you know, opening of a warrant to closing of the warrant, what you need to backtrack on, on what were plans you would have for outreach, education, you know, yeah. any kind of public discussion, info night, that yes. kind of thing. Another question about the roadmap assistance mm -hmm. program. Um, would, would, were we lucky enough to get um, uh, somebody from the state to come and talk us through this? Is that also for adopting this specialized code? Or, and do we have to be 2.0 before we can get estimated? Or we just have to be on the way toward committing to no, it? No, you, you don't have to be 2.0 in order, in order to get the decarbonization assistance. Yeah. So the decarbonization assistance is just for the decarbonization plan. Okay. It's not for the stretch not code. Not for everything else. Right, okay. it's, not, it's not for the, I shouldn't say the stretch code. You guys already have the stretch yeah. code, the specialized code. Right. <clears throat> right. Yep. And actually, there's a second part of your question. That's well, no, I, I, I probably was mixing up programs, but good news is that um, our library is going to meet stretch code and I don't know even beyond. I mean, it's going to be LED, lead certified, et cetera. So 
that's already going to move us in the direction of achieving some of the goals. But and, and it's not mm -hmm. using fossil fuels, right? It's no, it's going to be all electric. Yeah, yeah, so, right. or geothermal if so, we ever get there. Yeah, so that's mm -hmm. part of that would already be in the roadmap. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, right, you're already implementing a lot of what the roadmap is actually going to kind of spell out. It's going to help you identify how do you plan it out over over years. <laughs> Um, is there any, again, I, I feel bad, I, ca I can't see everyone on the, um, just zooming if in. If somebody raised their hand, they'd jump to the top, so nobody's got their hand up at this point. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, then that's good. Um, okay, D did you all any have any more questions on this? I mean, we're, we'll I have touch. to say I'm very supportive <laughs> of moving ahead on this, um, as we are on the MVP 2.0, so. Yeah, I think this is a, oops. I think this is the beginning of a conversation. Um, I think we need to sort of, as you said, work backwards. So mm -hmm. if we can say, okay, let's try for the fall town meeting, see if we can work backwards and make that happen, then and we start putting those things in place, um, we can we can have some of it happen at the fall town meeting. And if we aren't ready for another part of it, it's okay. We can take we can do that at the next town meeting. Um, but if we can start plugging away at the list, um, then, you know, then, then, we, then we can submit an application. Yeah, I, w I would feel more comfortable if we had a, you know, more of a, just a timeline. sort of a conceptual timeline mm -hmm. that we can all Yeah, work well, that, from. that's yeah. what I think is probably one of the yeah. things that we ought to start working on. Yeah, because yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm supportive. I, I think there's consensus on the whole select board. It, Trevor's at a school committee meeting tonight, so, um, but he's obviously, um, supportive of this too, I think. And if it becomes a, you know, if the select board decides that we want to move on this, then you will have the added resource of working with Casey and Christopher Dunn to, you know, uh -huh. at least after you've gathered information, Christopher knows a lot of the legislative Programs. stuff. Oh, great. So, um, but we do have some hands up here. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, um, Allison. Here. Yeah. Hi. Allison Gage from the FERCOG. I just wanted to ask a question related to the timeline. So when this program was being rolled out in October, um, I think there was a June 30th deadline for communities to apply to the 2.0. Will that, does that still stand? And if it does, if communities were to apply for the roadmap assistance, would it be okay if they had a timeline longer than June 30th for adopting like the specialized stretch code, which I imagine will take a little bit? Um, uh, yes, the June 30th and December 30th um, deadlines for applying are, 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 are still out there. Um, okay. We, I, I actually don't think we're going to have many for June 30th. It's, I think that's very fast. Um, yes. So I don't think it's going to be limited to, um, you know, the, the decarbonization help is not going to be limited to people who are already, you know, climate leaders 2.0, Minus the, the decarbonization map, <laughs> your decarbonization plan. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I, I missed the December 30th deadline, so that's great. Yes, okay, yeah. Thank you, Allison. Julie. Hi. Um, Julie Chopper, resident, I guess. Um, so I, I would just ask, when I look at the program, um, the two towns that have done it in Western Mass are Amherst and Northampton, which who are both quite a bit bigger than we are. And I think we need to be cognizant of the workload on our staff. Um, they're already pretty heavily loaded. And this program seems pretty big. Um, and so I think we need to just be aware of how much we're asking people to do when they're already pretty heavily loaded. That's why I keep mentioning Christopher Dunn, who's new here, <laughs> and we haven't, we haven't broke his back yet. Um, yeah, we don't I guess want that's to. also why I want to make sure we're getting the roadmap assistance. <clears throat> yes. Because um, that's where a lot of the work is going to be done. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, we were able to be MVP certified because we were already doing work, you know, we had damages from other events, and so a lot of the stuff that was required, we were doing already. So if the Energy Committee is doing a lot of stuff already along these lines, and we are obviously 
thrilled with our EV charging grant and you know certain things are happening already and hopefully we'll get the heat grant for the geothermal and I mean there's all, all these things we're already doing it makes sense to try to get this money from the roadmap which would give us you know the consulting help and it is easier to get help in the beginning rather than in the middle and yeah. the end because yeah. the funds are just not there and without totally ruining myself I, I think we on the energy committee can do what we can to reduce the administrative load on, right. on the right. I was thinking of Christopher more as in a um, sort of a coordinating capacity rather than doing the work because right. I know we need to rely on our volunteers yep. um, one thing and I know you don't set the policies Chris um, we should maybe flag this up to Ann Gobi, who is the Rural Affairs Director, to, to work with state departments to develop big city, medium-sized city, and rural communities. The rural communities should be the least burdened because we have the fewest resources to, to go after these monies. Right. But we're also going to be a major component of achieving the goals of the state. And um, we talk about economic justice and social mm -hmm. justice. We need to have rural justice. Um, and so if, for, to whatever we can do, um, you know, to, to have policies that are, that are s go from a spectrum of the people who are at least a bit able to apply for stuff and the people who have, you know, 100 person staffs for applying for grants. And what we struggle with is we're judged the same way Boston is in many cases. And, and so we need to have some more flexibility built into these programs. But as I say, it's not your bailiwick. <laughs> no, but I, I hear you, and I totally understand that. I'll also say that one of the reasons why one of the criteria to become a climate leader is that you do have a green group of some kind. This is the reason why. Mm -hmm. We recognize that if you're going to be a climate leader, you're going to need support from your community in a very formal way. You're going to need, you know, volunteers' help. So we have volunteers. Okay. And our volunteers are overstretched because they're, <laughs> <Yeah, all laughs> they're on five committees. <laughs> I have a question. Um, what kind of technical assistance is available around achieving these goals? Because there are times where we actually have to farm some of that technical assistance out um, to people like Allison Gage from the COG because they actually have that expertise that the staff doesn't have and the committee doesn't have. So what ki are there going to be things available to help us with those so, elements? Uh, so I, uh, I mean, the, the reason housing Cage can help you with, is because we give them money to do that. Um, so that is, you know, that, that's one of the ways where we do actually support the smaller communities is that we provide the, the, the regional planning agencies with funds to help the small towns. And that will continue. Um, <clears throat> um, I can't guarantee exactly what, um, you know what what they will be allowed to to apply for for mon money and what, what activities they can help with but we're supportive of this com of this uh, program um oh i lost my train of thought second uh, second step it happens to me all the time oh yes okay <laughs> i'm sorry okay and so there's, so there's there's one kind of technical assistance that you're talking about is kind of administrative technical assistance yes. right so that for cog will be we will continue to work with the planning, uh, regional planning agencies mm -hmm. to pass that kind of support down. <clears throat> the other kind of technical assistance that you're probably going to need as you get into looking at your buildings uh, um, you know, is engineering technical assistance. Mm -hmm. At the moment, um, uh, we provide the META grant, Municipal Energy Technical Assistance Grants. Yep. On an annual basis, we may increase that to twice a year because you're kind of recognizing that there's going to be, be a need for some. Um, and <clears throat> Um, that added pool that you could apply for if you were a climate leader mm -hmm. um, could well, very well, might include technical assistance, you know, engineering technical assistance that you could go for. That'd um, be great. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we actually have applied for a META grant um, <laughs> for, through Allison for an engineering study on Frontier's um, roof uh, for solar, structurally, what, what part of the roof can take solar right. and uh, we don't know when we're going to hear about that 
I can't, I, I can't tell you. <laughs> not yet, though. Not yet, not yet. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm really, it's unfortunate we could have a long conversation, continuing long conversation about this, but we have yeah. a huge agenda, yeah. so. And okay. just speaking of preparedness, thank you guys for the work on bringing in some money on the emergency stuff there. Oh, yeah. We had yeah, a lot of people uh, go to bat to, for us. Yeah. Was, Natalie and Joe really went to bat Natalie for us. Natalie and Joe were wonderful. And, and Jim but I Driscoll have to say, in the background. And Gobi. And Gobi, Kristen yeah. Aleko. I mean, people, yeah. no one really yeah, has yeah, spoken yeah, about. Yeah, you did too. And yeah. Gobi yeah, yeah. and Kristen Aleko. But, you know, both of them were really good. Part, even Pat Carnivali from Mima was wonderful. Well, thank you. I don't think it hurts to say a thank you to Joe and Natalie if anyone's oh, yeah. feeling like doing that. <laughs> I know. Yes. I actually I, I yeah. thank you. We do that every so hour much. on the hour. I know. I can't believe how, you know, in the in this past year, they've really advocated for us. No, and good. thank you so much. This is thank you, Chris. You're very welcome. Thanks, we'll be back. I know, Thanks, Chris. It was really wonderful to meet you. Thanks, Chris. And thank Same you for here. coming out on a kind of not very nice night. <laughs> Holden. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of <laughs> it is. It's raw. Right. Have thank a good you, night. Thank you. Thank you so night, much. Um, Casey, I'm gonna just skip over the budgets and come back to them because that, we could get drawn out on that. Yeah. So um, the next item on the um, agenda is the permits. Mm -hmm for a Yankee Candle and uh, for Valentine's Day celebration on February 10th. Um, I'll take a motion to approve that. I'll make that motion. Um, All the uh, insurance and being in order. Oh, yes. Well, they actually owe us 30 bucks, but um, I'm assuming Pat is going to keep on them before and not issue she it will. without collecting the fee. Um, so I will second the motion. All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Okay. Here you go, Tim, if you could sign that. Um, next item on the agenda um, is corrective action plan. Do we have that here? I don't see that on the agenda. What corrective action plan? This is the DEP corrective action plan for the um, uh, transfer station, you know, the solid waste stuff. So I will make a motion that to Kevin has correct, done that, and we will sign it. Um, Say that again. So what is you, what's for, your motion? This is for the corrective action plan and schedule for, from the inspection that was done on our transfer station. Okay, and so you made a motion? Yes. Okay, and the motion was, I didn't understand the motion. The motion is to sign, is to have, have the chair sign the corrective action plan. Okay, I'll second that. All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Okay. Um, just do this. I'm sure it's on here somewhere, Casey, but I'm just going to go ahead and sign it. I want to make sure everything that's in the file is signed mm -hmm. before we leave. I don't have to sign it, right? No. No, it's, I think it's just one signature. Um, uh, then we have uh, application to establish, this is a support letter um, signed by us for the open space committee to have, um, to the community preservation committee to fund an establishment of two conservation restrictions on own, land owned by the town on Comtic Ridge. So I will make that motion. And I'll second the motion. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. So here you go. And then we have um, a letter of support for Sunderland's application to the Mass Trails Grant. If, if awarded, the funds will be used to study the feasibility of a new shared path along Route 116 from Meadow Street intersection to Waitley Park ride and drive, uh, park and drive, ride over here in the south end of town. This uh, corridor lacks safe infrastructure for people for all ages to bike and walk, not to mention mobility impaired. So this is a letter of support for their application. And I would make a motion to support that. I'll second it. All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Okay, so if you can sign that. 
All right. Uh, there's a placeholder for the geothermal bylaw. It, that's just for review. We'll put it on a future meeting. I actually don't want it on the February meeting because I want to make sure we have enough time for budget items. So could you put that on, I don't know, the first meeting in March maybe, Casey? Is it something you're going to want to add to the warrant is no, my question. No, no, no. It's for us to think about what we want to do. It's, it's too big of an issue and there's, it's too technical to do anything too fast. So you want this added to the first meeting in March? I think so. Okay. And that can be bumped if it ends up we have a huge giant agenda in March. So. Okay. Um, Leary Lot Developments, Chris, do you have anything you want to um, update us on the Leary Lot? I do. So I included in your packet um, a, an updated opinion of probable cost that Jeff Squire was able to provide me with. Yes, that um, was really. It includes multiple columns. So the first one, that one that totaled 680,000 and change, was the first one that he developed. Uh, the second one was from early January this month, um, which had some value engineering suggestions. And in light of some recent funding that we have acquired, that I'm not going to go into the specifics of tonight, um, some addition alternates. So uh, those were included in response to a meeting between myself, Jeff, and our consultants over at Rivermore. Um, basically, the gist of it is when we include the grant money, there is going to be money left over after including the EV charging installation for the fast chargers, which is going to eat up a big portion of the amount received, but not the entirety. Um, so there are a number of improvements that could likely be made to the design. So these were just some of Jeff's initial ideas. Um, and I was hoping to leave tonight's meeting with a little bit of direction um, over whether the board was interested in some of these things. Like, for instance, increased depth of reservoir course to 12 inches was the first one listed. Uh, that was for the porous asphalt specifically. Um, increasing caliper sizes, um, shrub quantities. Um, are these things that the, the board is interested in, in terms of some, some site improvements with the extra money? Absolutely. Um, yes, but I would like to, you know, find out, particularly about the trees, um, if there's any, if we need to do anything to this plan. Um, I think the plantings for the, the smaller plants, they're probably native species and they probably would require specialized knowledge and so forth but if if we have to cut something for some reason i don't know what that reason would be is there any alternative for us to maybe work with a local somebody like yap molinar to you know plant our own trees um because it's a 40 i i i don't have that in, um oh, here. i didn't find it in my packet i mean i have it from somewhere else but i think that charge is like um increasing the caliper of the trees uh, does that add $69,750? Chris? I think it brings the total to 69750 versus the 43000 that it had been before. Okay. Yeah, I think it increases. So um, I, I just want to make sure that we, before there's a commitment to the, also the species on the trees, I mean, the shrubs, we can, we have a list, and I, I already told um, Jeff that, that there's a list on the MACD um, website, and that, bo oh, both the Mass Association of Conservation Districts and the Franklin Conservation Districts have native shrubs um, that are really good choices, um, but I, the trees, we don't, we don't have a list of trees, and I, I want to make sure when we purchase these trees, we have been told our tree belt needs to be d diversified, and we need to have some climate, more climate resistant trees besides maples, because poor maples are dying, so, um, and are not going to be able to really um, handle climate change. So I want to make sure the tr tree choices that we review the tree choices, um, Chris, and have some 
somebody telling us what we should be purchasing. I know there's like a, a resilient, now a resilient, um, a similar species to the American elm. You know, things like that. I, I want to hear, see what the choices are before we are okaying a purchase. Does yeah, um, and just let me, I may have misunderstood, but we have some good news about grants and, um, but this is not gonna, I think I've talked with you about this offline, Chris. Um, we expect that this is all gonna be very affordable and it won't, won't really involve any town resources other than coordinating the project. Um, so I, my, my, my observation about the tree costs will change dramatically if, if, if this overall grant that we're talking about mitigates all of that. I don't need to worry about it. Sure, that makes sense. Um, so really, we want to keep this project moving. And in order to do that, um, we're still hoping that we can keep Berkshire Design on track for a bid package in the near future. Yep. Um, and getting that bid package done, we want to make sure that these specific things are accounted for. So I can talk to Jeff tomorrow um, or later this week, depending on when he has time, and see what kind of specificity he can get into regarding those native tree species, um, and and we can go from there. But well, I mean, would it be helpful for us to to express an opinion tonight? If, if would that speed the thing along? I mean, because if you don't have to wait for us, sure. Um, I, I, if you express an opinion tonight, I can absolutely bring it to Jeff and uh, report back at your next meeting. Okay, and Casey, Casey wants to. I have a comment just about that. If there is a list of trees that are more climate resilient that Jeff can get a hold of, he might be able to just add those as examples of trees in the specifications, and Chris. That's fine. And that's fine. Because then you have a choice. Um, and I, that's how I would frame it with him. I think if you do that, he can help us d right. do a workaround that meets the needs of what was just discussed. But I just want to make sure our investment is in the, you know, properly. The more climate choices. resilient trees. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think like if there is list, yep. that yeah. would be easier. So I guess I'm looking for direction. What would be the best? At, what would be the most advantageous for us to get this RFP out the door to approve something tonight? And if so, what do we need to approve? Um, essentially, I will let Jeff know that based on our, our current grant funding situation, I mean we're we're working on a bit of an odd timeline right now since we haven't signed the grant contract yet, and that's something that's making me very uneasy. Um, and I know that's just the pace of the federal government, um, but. We want to get that signed as soon as humanly possible. And as soon as I get that, I will make sure that we put that on steroids and make sure that it gets supercharged. Um, but as for right now, we find it fairly safe to assume that this federal grant that we've been announced as an awardee for is going to make a big difference in the planning for this project. And if the board is comfortable, I will let Jeff know to include the enhanced features in his bid package. Perfect. Yeah. So, do we need a motion on that, or just consensus? I think is, by consensus they've yeah. agreed. Uh, yeah. We we both agree, so it's fine. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you for all your hard work on this, Chris. Um, Chris and I. Also, My pleasure. I just want to point out having the different pots of money available. Your explanation was very helpful. Thank you. It's uh it's not final yet. We. Uh, are waiting on some updated figures that are going to have to come in from Eversource on the make ready. Um, it, it's probably going to be more than I have indicated right now because right now that doesn't affect the D, uh, it doesn't account for the DC fast charging uh, reimbursement. So those numbers aren't final, but it is a good start. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, we have two appointments for um, the. Two appointment Can, requests. Two appointment requests um, for the Community Preservation Committee. And we as Select Board only have one at the moment. Um, I And also, um, there's a, I think we ought to put this on hold um, because the current makeup of the board, the, the current CPC chair is a planning board member who is not going to be seeking re-election and um, as the chair, we're going to probably have to save our appointment for that person or find another way to 
have the chair serve, and it might involve having a bylaw change. And so I don't think we should, I think we should put this on hold because they currently have, with the exception of some committee, uh, town committee p people who don't show up. Oh, I thought we did, I thought we had a vacant. I don't you think You have so. one select board vacancy. Um, right, and. But my concern would be quorum, like Tim's saying. Right. I mean, so it's have, up to you what you so want to have do. Currently, they, they have quorum. They meet their quorum. They have, like the rec department never comes. Right, I know. Okay, so um, they're trying to work through that. Um, we don't have a housing authority, so we ha have never been able to appoint a housing person. And the bylaw change would be around changing um, our bylaw for CPA to allow for us to appoint somebody who is an, in, in, representing the interests of the housing. Within the town, that's right. not a, a so you don't regional one. I don't. Okay, that's fine, that's fine. And, um, and I, I spoke to at least one of these candidates and uh, he's aware that this is what, what we're facing. And, okay, um, all right, I just wanna make sure that we get back to them and tell yeah. them we're really excited we're about their interests. Yeah, we're, yeah, I'm Chris Curtis already, we had this discussion. Peter James, I don't, I don't know this I person. I can call Peter, I can call yeah. Peter. Cause that was who I was gonna recommend is Peter because he was the one of the original, um, you know, he was an architect of the CPC bylaw. Yeah. He, yeah, no. he was very instrumental in creating. And, and then that's great, and then I, I would absolutely support that. Um, it's just that we're gonna be playing musical chairs just to realign the, okay, the pieces, so and then we'll actually have a fully functional, well, you know. So what I term wise, there's a term question here too. So. Um, Are we only appointing till June 30th? Anyway? Yeah, that, that would be my question. If you're only appointing to June 30th. So the planning board person is still there. Until June 30th. Right. Uh, no, until May. Right. When the election oh, takes until May. Oh, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. So. That's the okay. nuance, Carolyn. All right. All right. I understand now. Because I, I was confused. Yeah, that, so now it makes more sense to me, too. Yeah. All right. Okay. So we'll hold off. I'll, I'll call Peter and tell him that we're going to hold off until we start yeah, this Tell out. him that we support his application, but we just want to do it in the most effective way for the CPC moving forward. Yeah. Okay. Um. The only other thing that we have before we get to Casey's report is the town assistant town clerk's job description. Did you have any, I, I, I mean, it looks fine. Who, who, did the personnel committee um, review this and they're okay with this? They did. So what this represents is, is. This is the new, new. This is the revamped position that okay. includes supervision and it, all right. Lots of changes. So yeah, no, it seemed like it was okay, still but still part time and um, it's still part time, yeah. but it really it removes some of the financial crossover functions that happened with when the town clerk, treasurer, collector was one position. It supervision it indicates a higher level of independence, resolution, adaptation, and implementation of processes to do certain things. Um, judgment and complexity are increased because there's an understanding that this person's going to have to have the same understanding and ability to work within the statutory and regulatory requirements, the bylaws, and work with the guidance or lack of guidance that often exists. So you gotta be able to parse the information. Confidentiality is the same level as the town clerk. Um, and there were some things that, so this was a work through with several people, Chris, um, Cassie, Brenda, myself, looking at this. And there was some information that was critical in terms of adding you know, context to abilities because you want somebody to be able to deal with automated systems and record keeping, social media, the ability to research and organize large amounts of written material mm -hmm. because that's what the town clerk does. Right. Um, plus you want attention to detail, strong organizational skills, and you want diplomacy and problem solving skills just as a regular type of performance. So the personnel board went through this yesterday um, and they approved it. I wanted to make sure I had the ability to bring it to you for, your, for you to review and consider approval. 
And then the question after that is, if you approve it, would you be willing to endorse us putting the vacancy out so we can hire for this position? I'm fine with that. I read through it. Yeah, I, I didn't have any problems with it. And you, uh, we'd spoken about this at another meeting. And, uh, yep, so, and I know um, that Cassie really needs the help with the heavy election load coming up. So I think we should. Um, I'll take a, entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the uh, job description for the assistant town clerk as presented. I'll second that. All those in favor? Tim Hill, GI. Carolyn Ness, I. Thank you. Do we you. also need to, do we want to authorize the town, town administrator to take steps to put this job out to? Oh, yeah. I'll we make that approve. motion. I will second that. All those in favor? Tim Hill, GI. Carolyn Ness, I. Okay. Thank you, double time. Okay, one more um, thing to, um, I just wanna make sure, uh, I know this sounds so dumb, but or I shouldn't say dumb, but I need permission, or I feel like I need permission to represent the town on the not weed coalition. <laughs> There is a This is your wheelhouse, weed, Carolyn. <laughs> I know. There's a knotweed coalition putting together, you know, towns and uh, nonprofit groups to fight knotweed up and down as an invasive. And I was going to participate, uh, but I, then I thought, you know what, I just need to clear it with the, you know, the other members of the select board um, to make sure that they're, you're okay with it. You feel compelled. I think you would be a good person to battle not, not weed. <laughs> not that my opinion counts, but I, I agree with you. All right. So she knows a lot about it. I just I just want to make sure that everyone is aware then that the town of Deerfield will be participating in the not weed coalition, and I will be the representative to the not weed coalition. And when I was the conservation chair, we had a a, a recent resident who used to work for the federal EPA who voluntarily came with the eradication plan for her house lot. She might be a good resource too and I think Pete Law would, um, she had a three year plan to do this on her property. And yeah, so. well it's, it's pretty overwhelming truly if you're gonna do it right. But, um, so I'm gonna have Chris put this on our website. There is a presentation at the Hitchcock Center for the environment on um, February 8th. You can do it in person or remote at 6.30 p.m. is what, we sh what you should know about Knotweed 101. And then, uh, like this said, there's a Knotweed coalition of communities that are trying to get together. So I will be, I was tasked with being the representative and I am volunteering as long Excellent. As the yeah. board is fine with it. And this okay. also means that we can't have a meeting at night on February the 8th. Just oh. So Carolyn won't be available. Carolyn won't be available. See, there's a benefit to not weed. You'll have to do chair pro tem, Tim. All right. <laughs> oh, my God. Not weed. Oh, God. I didn't even think about that. I'm not that far ahead of All right. Anyway, moving along here. Um, it looks like we're down to the town administrator report and the assistant administrator's report. Do you want to go first, Chris, or do you want me to? Either one is fine with me. All right, I'll shoot these. I got, I got a bullet point list. So I've been working with Kathy and Lily and um, town council about the community preservation committee membership that Tim referenced, um, because there's we need to develop a solution for the housing membership um, in the bylaw. So I do think we may be looking at a change to the bylaw. I do, Kathy's been great about sharing information from Stuart Saganor, so I have some information from him. And then we're gonna meet, Chris and I are gonna meet with Kathy on Friday to get some further discussion going on that. Um, the, there's some planning that's gonna come up around projects and development of, of the sources around the payment for all of this road, these road repairs that will happen internally on top of what you guys discussed today. Um, so that's sort of in the works and has been go ongoing. Um, there is some work around the Tilton Library addition and renovation project. It's RFP contract documents that have to be, that we have to go through council with, so I've been working on that. 
um, with Phil and with um, Dan Pilata. Um, there's also this element, Lily and I have been working with council on a couple questions we had about the purchase of the former St. James Church property. So I'm gonna have some discussion with the owner as soon as she and I can set a time. Um, I did the notice of award went out to Pittsfield Pipers for the police HVAC system contract, or um, I'm sorry, bid. Um, and the contracts have gone out for their review. I haven't heard back from them. I do anticipate there may be a couple of tweaks, but we'll see how in-depth they get. Um, the feasibility study for the senior center location has come back to the sort of the radar screen. Um, so I'm gonna be doing a little work with Jennifer and possibly the other town administrators on this. Um, so which crowd are we talking about? So the feasibility study for siting, we had gotten a community compact regionalization and efficiency grant, or efficiency and regionalization right. grant on it. And it sort of sat on hold when the 23 Plumtree Road property came up. Um, and I had a conversation with Jennifer about it, but I've also had a conversation with Denise Mason because she had worked with me on that grant. So we were talking about that the other day and there's some follow up that I'm going to be doing, but there's also, I believe the Sunderland select board is hosting a open house. And I think it may be this weekend. I don't, I couldn't find an email in my, in my email box but I think it may be this weekend, um, to do a tour of the site. Um, but any municipal land purchase is not a short-term quick fix. It doesn't happen quickly most of the time. So that being the case, if there was something that fell through, if we have an understanding of what other, what other spaces might be available, that might be useful for us to have in our back pockets. So I'm gonna work a little bit on that. Um, the 1821 building, uh, Structures North is coming out tomorrow. It's tomorrow, right? Yeah, it's tomorrow to at 9.30. To look at the roof at the, in the um, sanctuary over at the 1821 building. So we'll have some more information on that. I don't know, ex they're gonna be out for several hours. I don't know exactly what all that work's gonna look like, but it's gonna help get us towards the specs for bid, for the okay. work. Don't forget we have at 10 o'clock tomorrow, um, yeah. the farmers, uh, well, landowners, and farmers forum. Yes. Yeah, I know, but I'm I'm just going to basically be letting them in, show them where they need to go, and then yeah. leaving them alone because I I haven't got nothing to add to that. Right. They okay. have to do the work that oh, they have to do. I just was hoping you could be here. Yeah. Um. So the Weston and Sampson Engineer peer review has been received, and I sent it off to the nonprofits. Um. I. The idea, and Carolyn had mentioned this to me. Um it might be a good idea to sit down and talk this through and have everybody at the table. It's a question of when we can set up a meeting because that's one thing that Trevor, all three of you need to be at, but Trevor isn't back until next week. Oh yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't planning on doing it um, Monday. He's coming in Monday, so. Yeah, so maybe later next week we could do yeah. it. Um, and it would have to be a special meeting. I haven't reached out to Matt Sheehy. I did mention it, but I haven't reached back out because I need to, that's a coordination I, I thing. I think either Thursday or Friday of next week would be good. Only because, um, you know, we're, we're already overcommitted for that first full week of February. Um, yes. So if we could do it either. Maybe we could do it Groundhog Day. First or February second. second. Yeah, the February 1st would be great, uh, or February 2nd, because um, we already are filling up um, the week of the 5th. Um, so so what am we, I missing the week of the 5th? Uh, that's just, it's already starting to be busy with... Oh, we have like a... We yeah. have two select board meetings each week you're, that you have a regular right. meeting, because you're going to have right. joint... You know, budget meetings and then regular select board on the 7th, I think, right? I know. And um, we're, 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 no, SCEMS is the next week. But anyway, er, everything is busy. You know, we have, I have Homeland Security the first, first Tuesday and the second, I mean, and the third Tuesday and got a million of yeah, so Yeah, it's, if he can it's do busy one, season. If you can do one or two, that'd be great. Okay. Um, that would be something typically we would do like at, 
one o'clock or something? Well, sometime uh, in the afternoon. But well, we're trying to get a little bit later in the afternoon, so that we can get Trevor here. So, so we can get Trevor. Oh, here. Trevor. Yeah. 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 No, that's and we good. need to have Eric meals here as well. Yeah. yeah. So we try to do it at the end of Eric's work day. So that was what she had asked me to do. Yeah. I will no, work on the second three or, or four, first. Ten. Okay, as long as it's not five, I want to have dinner with my wife. I know, I know, I know. So one of the other elements that Kevin and I have been working on is this ADA complaint that we're trying to settle. We had sent through the signage and uh, pictures, a letter and the signage pictures that showed us trying to remedy the situation. They came back and asked us for additional an additional sign to add to it. So Kevin put that up. I haven't been able to finish the letter to send it back. That Perfect. should settle that uh, complaint okay. from what the uh, Architectural Access Board representative said to me. Perfect. Um, there's some road things that are sort of in the stratosphere. Um, Evans Lane and the Mill Village Road flooding complaint. Kevin and I have talked, to that, talked about that several times. Um, it actually led to an informal road acceptance inquiry um, from the person that complained. I, I don't. I don't want. I want us to organize. It's much more complex. Right. I want us to organize a process for um, adopting roads. So that's. And I had mentioned this to you. Um, one of the things that came out of the experience we had with Greylock and Snowberry was we really need a policy that says if if we residents do. are coming to the town and asking us to do the road acceptance, there's. On their part, they need to accept that they're, we don't budget for that. And there are costs associated with this. There's legal costs, there's registration costs, there's survey costs, there's all those things. So I think to some extent, if the board has a policy, then we can turn around and say, okay, this is the process, this is what we expect you to pick up in costs. Please do that because we have private roads and in town and I've already gotten phone calls myself. Okay. People inquiring. So I already said that we are working on a process that will formalize. You know, I, I said the roads had to. I said the roads have to be br over, redone and brought up to code. Right. That's the other issue is and, bringing them up to a. And they said, specs. well, where is it in writing? And I said, well, we don't move it forward unless the roads are brought up to code. So. I think the specs are in the bylaws and the statute. We need to have a formal policy to say that. In my okay, um, you know this is I, I to hand them up the sheet that gives you this is what you have to do is perfect. Okay, but one of the things I have to say is the town is not accepting roads that are not brought up to code. Okay, and that includes under underground in, uh, infrastructure like drainage. And to your point, and. It's not the tw five year or 25 year storm, it's the 100 year storm is what we're asking the uh, roads to be brought up to code because that's what we're replacing is 100 year storm standards. So here's my question. I don't know that the road specs in the bylaw meet that criteria, although I think DOT they might. Don't. Because the norm, the norm is a 25 year storm, but the we don't have 25 year storms anymore. We have 100 year storms. So we need to spell out that we are expecting the road to be brought up to code to 100 year. So that standard. might lead to a different question. Um, and I actually had a thought about that too. So if we had to make a change to identify a 100 year storm, that might require us to make a bylaw change uh, around the roads because we do have details in our, our road specs. Well, you could. One of the things that came out of Irene on the Creating Resilient Communities group that we started here in Deerfield for the Deerfield River Rise Shed is that the road standards were adopted from Vermont. We had Mass DOT adopt Vermont road standards, and that might encompass the 100 year storm because it's oh. a 25% increase in build back. Did DOT accept them? Yes, that is one of the things that people don't have any oh. idea how much work went into that and how wonderful it was because we are now, when we build back, we build back at a larger scale. Okay. And that is the acceptable standard now. So at some point we may have to make those changes anyway. I have to go back and look. I'm, I would need to talk to 
right. Kevin too. But so that was a thought. It came a, around yeah. that question, and I had asked Carolyn. Well, I about just it. I just <laughs> want to make sure that we're not accepting the 25-year storm mm -hmm. norm because that's okay. not. It could be. Um, it could be that we asked the planning board to work with the DPW on and and the planner on some bylaw adjustment adjustment that we can specific to adoption of you know private roadways um and i don't know if the building department would have any input into that but it's obviously going to take some time well my so a policy i think it would be great if we could fix the specifications in the bylaw because that's really what needs to be tight policies one thing that I've been warned is policies are much easier to adjust as things adjust around you. Right. Um, but definitely those specifications, even if we reference the DOT. Right. Uh, I mean, I basically, I think it would be nice if we wrote bylaws that referred to policies, because then you can change referred the Referred policy. to policies and somebody else's standards that we don't have to replicate. Yeah, yeah and say so that way it, it, it just adjusts all the time whenever the state changes the law. That's yes, the law. that's what I usually try to do. Yeah. I try. I don't always win, but I try. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so then there was some work I've been doing on STAM, and a lot, a, a lot of it revolves around programming and the legislative priorities. So I actually have paper copies of the legislative priorities that I will give to you. But I'll just put them in your box. But the design of the one-page sheet that is the legislative priorities is for towns to say, oh, we're going to put our name here, and these are the things we follow. Um, I think we talked about them in a STAM meeting over the weekend at the conference, and at the there was a planning meeting for the Western Mass and Rural Conference. So I, that would, they were mentioned there by the president of STAM, Denise Dempkowski. So I'll give them to you just so you can chew on okay. them. Um, but it's it might be worthwhile. I know that you have priorities that relate to some of the bills that Natalie and Joe in particular have out there. But some of these overarching things that may not have a bill assigned or just are easy things for people to absorb was the intent of <coughs> developing that one page sheet. I, I just want to make it crystal clear that it's, it's absolutely essential that we get N Joe and Natalie's rural school bill done and the you know, disaster aid. Disaster relief fund. Right. Fund those, done. those, yeah. And those are pretty top priority for most of us. Um, and they are top priority in that list. So rural affairs, uh, director meetings, they usually happen once a week. And you had, it's on the agenda, so you had talked about this earlier, the top three priorities you want. Um, I will transcribe those. I was actually helping Chris Mason with his stuff, so I didn't hear everything. Uh, but I've asked Chris if he can help me pull that together. Um, some of the other things that are going on relate to budgets and find other financial tasks. So I do think it would be useful if we could consider having a semi-annual quarterly tax billing discussion with the assessors. So I'm going to ask Karen if she can give me some dates that we could meet um, because I think we need to get on that. It, it's the more of these loans we have and the more staggered things are, the more we need to keep in mind that we have to have constant funds. Otherwise, we run into issues. Just want to make sure that um, I'm following your... So the, the STAM thing, there was an Ann Gobi thing right after it. And I just wanted to make sure that, that we flagged this dredging program up to date. I Don tried Pete. to listen to, there was a workshop, there was right. an info session on it. Yeah. I tried to listen to it. I don't know that it fits anything, but I did want to take a second and talk to Kevin about it. I don't know if we have anything that fits. That's really, I just put it out there because it's something that we talked about in the director meeting. Uh, I think I looked at this and I think it relates specifically to something like being able to work in the Bloody Brook. That's I, what I, I thought, and, but I'm not an expert. Yeah, so that's why I was saying Christopher Dunn should be made aware of it if he's not already. I think I might have poured Pete Law and the DPW. I was just going to say they all should be involved in one conversation. So because, you know, everybody around here says, oh, we used to dredge the Bloody Brook. And um, now they're actually making it possible because 
you know, laws conflict, conservation laws conflict, conflict with dredging. So yep. um, it, it could be a great thing for us. It's a pilot program. I think it's... It is a pilot program. We could, we could do some good work with it. Right. Um, okay, sorry to interrupt. No, no, that's, uh, that's one of the things. That's why I was trying to get you something to read tonight because I knew I wanted you to see things like that. So to, to the extent that you just had that comment, I will try to reach out to Kevin and Christopher and see maybe Pete Lossie if they can get in a room and talk. Yeah, Pete's going to be going away in like the first February week of 8th. Fe yeah, February 8th, so it would be a good thing to flag up to all of them. And He'll be here tomorrow. He's going to be a, yeah. a few okay. minutes late, but he'll be here tomorrow, and that might be a good opportunity to talk to everyone about that because I do feel like this is a pilot program. It is a pilot program. We have huge problems. We need to participate. Yeah, and in fact, I mean, Henry Melnick's farm has a brook that runs through it, and I'm not sure if it's a bloody brook or if it's another brook, but they're having tremendous erosion problems over there, and so this could be a... Oh, no, that's... Um, we're going to address that through NRCS. I know, but I'm just saying yeah. there's examples all across Deerfield where this could be... Right, bad. absolutely. That's what I initially thought, but I'm not as read into how the conditions of the culverts yeah. are to know. Yeah. Oops. Um, Good. So omnibus budget and capital, there's, to your point about budgets, Carolyn, the one that I'm having the most difficulty right now is contracted services because we need to make some changes in what opportunities we have for people for Office 365 and that workability, but we also need to have a higher level of um, protection, cybersecurity protection, and that comes with a cost. So I'm going to be talking to Entree about that. Um, there's also working up the capital uh, meeting schedule. I have a meeting with Mark Brennan on Friday. We're going to talk about the, the applications and the meeting schedule and timing so that we can meet the requirements in the bylaw. But when I was talking to you today, you made a comment that made me, that we talked about, and it was maybe considering making a change in the bylaw to change that deadline for annual town meeting projects um, because it can be we don't always know by november end of november beginning of december what might come up um, so i wonder if there's a way to consider flexibility in uh, creating some flexibility in the we did that a couple of years ago. annual elements of we did we did make a change it was to um, the timing of the hearings um, but we didn't touch on changing that December first date so I just well, wanted it, you to think about that right I don't have a problem with it but we changed the, um, the the December date is for known projects that we know about and then we opened it up that the CIPC could um, consider other projects that come up during the mi middle of the year, like grant, you know, like we had a washout, um, you know, say we had a washout in, in January, you know, this Friday's, Friday's rainstorm that's coming, okay? So how, if you don't, if you don't have some consideration for emergency stuff in the middle of the year. So maybe that's the language we put in, something right. to that yeah, effect. I think we did that. We have some, but it's usually after the beginning of the fiscal year. So I want to read it again. Right. I didn't get a chance to read it after we talked this afternoon. Right. So but I thought we fixed it so that you could have uh, reconsideration of other ones, uh, you know, or other stuff that comes up during the year. Right, right. You know, other truck, stuff that comes up during truck, the year after town meeting. Right. A truck breaks in the, you know, in the snowstorm in February. We yeah. have the ability to review a replacement and get it on town meeting. Okay. And it's obviously missed the December de deadline. I think somehow we fixed that. Well, that's, that's what I want to do is <clears throat> be able to dig into that All a right. bit. Um, there's also, so I've been working on a, several of the grants that are sort of coming through our office. Community One Stop, we had two meetings. We had the review meeting with Christopher, Denise, um, myself, and representatives. Ann Gobi was there, Mallory, her, her staff person was there, um, and then uh, Shay from the grant 
community one-stop uh, regional office was there. And so we had a conversation about community one-stop and the takeaways from that, I think we're gonna get a lot of traction out of Christopher Dunn being in that room and hearing those things. He's got some thoughts about this and he's working on some background information. So I think you're gonna hear more from him about this later in February, because one thing that they did say during that meeting was we should apply again, but we should make some tweaks to our application. So he has some thoughts about that. And I, in the meeting we had Monday, Denise and I had with him, I, said, I suggested that maybe he take it to a CCI meeting so that he can, hit more of the group that's really in the background doing a lot of the work that connects to some of the community one-stop goals, which include the 1821 building mm -hmm. and the 1888 building. So I think you'll see that later in February. And I had a brief conversation with Christopher, and he's, to reference back to the 75,000 grant that we got for, mm -hmm. I think it was the community one-stop or whatever it was being it called was at the time. It was community compact. Yeah. Um, we need to make sure that we expend the money so that we don't have money from them that we haven't spent for a year right. and a half. That's so, what he thinks we need to do is finish up that feasibility so that we can expend that grant and have a solid work product. Yeah, because the, the, the BOO approved that more than a year ago. We were in the church building over there talking about it and then nothing ever happened. That's an offline conversation. Um, so there's also some legal that has, is continuing follow-up. One of them is the ATM warrant um, and article development because there's several things that I've been, I've had requests for. So the board's asked for an article, and I should just list them. So we need an opioid funding article to take the money that was rolled into free cash from our opioid funds that we received at the end of last year and release them into a special revenue fund, which we can now do. Um, we need the library trustees have, or Candace has come back on behalf of the library trustees and asked that we reconsider the article that they requested last year to separate the library trustees and the Tilton Fund. And there's some information that she and I are sharing back and forth. I expect to get some communication from them relatively soon. We have several bylaws that we should consider making changes to, not the least of which is CPC um, personnel and uh, CIPC like we just talked about. Um, there's also, I don't know if there's any zoning that is gonna come up. I haven't, I had asked Denise about it, but I don't know if there's anything else coming up from another area. Not any that I'm aware of. So. You know, these are some of the elements, and I will email it to you. I have a draft. I just wasn't able to finish it up by the, by the time I had okay. to print some stuff earlier today. So those are some of the things you're looking at. Um, but the main, one of the main ones was a request on behalf of individuals on the board, the select board, to put an article to rescind a portion of the borrowing that was approved in now that we know we have some money from the state they'll be giving us some money so consideration to rescind a portion of that borrowing so that everybody can feel more comfortable about the fact that we will find a way to pay for these roads we'll probably end up using some town funds but we do have 1.8 1.58 million from the state that's been committed and we should see those funds in the next in the upcoming weeks i wasn't told exactly how many weeks but we should see them relatively oh yeah soon. no it's within 30 days i guess so that's what ann said that being the case if the board um wants to consider rescinding a portion of that borrowing it will certainly free up our ability to borrow if we have some other necessity that comes up um, I think uh, the, there's, no, there's no issue. The consensus on the board is we're going to rescind as much as we possibly okay. can. I just wanted to let people know that yeah. that is on the radar screen. It, there is a placeholder. Right. I want it just left blank because, honestly, we still have, um, you know. We don't know exactly what amount we would want to put in there. Well, we have six weeks of winter left, and right. I am concerned about Hawks Road making it through completely. Mm -hmm. So. We're so I, I hear you, so I left that blank, and like I said, I'll forward out the draft yeah. that I have. 
Um, and then there's just miscellaneous stuff that takes up time. I've had some questions about programs. I've had some questions about, we've had two pretty top heavy public records requests. So we're gonna, I'll be meeting with um, a couple of people tomorrow to talk about how we approach those. So that's pretty much where I am. Chris is up next. Hey, I'm still here. That so, means you're a champ. Um, <laughs> a couple of things to touch on that I included in my report. It's not exhaustive. There's been other stuff, but this is just a page. Um, so Treehouse Brewing Company, the board approved a memorandum of agreement at its last meeting. I've sent it off to Treehouse and we're currently waiting to get it back. Um, I think they're having some internal conversations on that, so hopefully we get an update on that soon. Once that takes effect, uh, then the new food truck procedure will go into place. Um, Chris, Open I'm Space and gonna, Recreation Committee. I, Chris, um, I'm just so, going to interrupt you for one second just to say sure. that um, Treehouse also has notified us that um, it's unlikely that they're going to have um, big co concerts as planned because they didn't... Uh, weren't able to book any that big names so it will be similar size events to what has already occurred so okay just to let people know that um you know this next year is not going to change really their operation at this point okay go ahead sorry thank you for the update all good so um open space and recreation committee so i know earlier you guys went through the red folder and caught that one thank you for signing um it's left over from your previous meeting they just wanted a, a letter of support to memorialize the board's vote um des entryway i've been working with christopher dunn chris curtis jeff squire darius shelly pareda and brenda on coordinating the logistics for the planned engineering and construction of the green entryway project it's mostly just been about timeline we've had a couple of conversations in the past couple of weeks about where the various pieces are going to come into play um, so that's that's coming along nicely and that's going to be an fy25 construction project uh, mvp 2.0 last week before the mma conference i went to a western regional cohort meeting for the mvp 2.0 grant uh, just a reminder, we're one of 36 communities across the state that's participating in that. It's a pilot program, meaning that we're figuring it out at the same time that the state is figuring it out. Um, so it was really beneficial to hear the perspectives of other communities and hear the, the common challenges that have been had. Um, and it's, it's always good to connect with our regional coordinator, Andrew Smith. Um, Last week, I also finished the second of three courses for the One Free Designate MCPPO program that I'm doing. Uh, the third one is going to start mid-February and run until late March. Uh, more on procurement, I have been helping Jen Remillard and Chief Pachurik. Uh, both of them have needed some Apple devices recently. Uh, in the case of the Senior Center, it's for a raffle that's been planned for a while um, that was grant funded. And Chief Pachurik reached out to me last week about purchasing some Apple products for some of his officers. Um, so that's coming along nicely. I've been directing them to a vendor on the state's ITC 73 contract for IT hardware and services. Uh, state revolving fund draft IUPs. Um, so this is something that Elena Cohen from Senator Comerford's office had reached out to Casey and I about right before the new year. Um, the revolving fund IUPs for the coming fiscal year included three Deerfield projects. Uh, it was the Deerfield Fire District with their uh, asset management plan, as well as the stormwater asset management plan and the sewer asset management plans for the town. Um, and I was able to rely on the expertise and summary skills of Skip Yaswinski and Justin Skelly, who on pretty short notice were able to help put something together to send over. And Senator Comerford is going to be testifying on behalf of those uh, during the hearing on January 31st. So that's some good news. We hope to see those funded. Um, and then finally, ChargePoint. I've been granted administrative access to our ChargePoint account. Uh, which is going to enable me to go in and make those changes that the board approved earlier this evening. Thank you again for doing that. I think it's it's going to make a good difference. Perfect. 
Thank you, Chris. Do you have any questions, Tim? I do not, and I don't have any new items, and I hope nobody else does. Oh, me either. Did we already do this, this mass trails? We yes, did. you did. did. Yes, we signed that. Um, geez, I, there was a couple things. What did I have? I wanted to acknowledge um, DDIC's report by John Pachork Sr. And I guess we can go back now to the budgets for a couple minutes. I have to tell you, in a half an hour, it'll be 12 hours that I've been. No, the doing only thing I wanted to bring up today. was the contracted <laughs> services. So I have a couple of notes about contracted okay. services. Um, right. And I think I mentioned it a few minutes ago. Is So we need to address our security in our email and our. Um, access to Office 365 for our general work. Um, but we also have a critical need here. Our, our phone system is 15 years old and it is failing. And we have an opportunity to use a subscription service option instead of buying a new phone system. And this would mean I wouldn't have to put in a capital request, which I didn't do because I knew this was out here. Uh, but what it does mean is it means an increase to contracted services. Because the idea is you have a subscription service. They provide you with the phones. But it's an upgraded type of system. So it's a voice over internet protocol. Um, there's less downtime. We may be able to eliminate one service. Um, that we currently use for our phone systems. I had asked Chris, I had asked Chris Nolan and Pat Kroll to look into it, um, and we're going to circle back around and just we have to we have a pre uh, not a presentation we have a proposal from our current vendor phone vendor, and I'm fairly sure that this exists in other areas like combis. So I'd ask Pat and Chris to review that so we can come back and make a determination to put this information in. I'm hoping to have that ready for you guys by next week. I don't know that I will have it ready for the joint meeting on Monday, but I will try. So those are a couple of elements. The other thing was technical assistance for grants and stuff, like grants. It's something that when I send a draft budget out for you guys to look at, we're going to need to talk about. It does, that, that budget actually hinges on finalizing administrative costs. So Brenda would be very happy with me if I could finalize it by the end of the week. Okay. Everything else was routine, and I had given you guys copies of the budgets. If you go back and look at your folder um, or your email, you'll see that if you want to review most of them. There were, the increases I think I had talked about before were certainly increases in select board expense because we've seen increases in the costs for training, meetings, and the general workload with more people. Okay. So those, I had emailed those to you. If you want me to resend them out, I can do that. Uh, no, I'm just trying to figure out a time where we're going to have time to discuss some of this stuff separately it just um, we have so much on our agendas so I, I just don't see how we're yeah this is its own meeting yeah um, I think we need an extra meeting truthfully um, Tim are, are you you're not going away anywhere in February are you oh sorry so the select board um, Brenda asked me when to schedule the select board budgets for presentation and we're scheduled for the 12th so if we do oh, I something you said the 26 hmm you told me the 26 did I I thought I sent the schedule um, you told uh, me 5 p.m. on the 26 I thought I, oh Board of Health is on the 26th okay um, hold on let me get you the Board of Health is on the 26th, so the regular select board is on the 12th? Let me check. Yes. Regular select board budgets are at 615 on the 12th. The 26th is select board and Board of Health budgets. It's a continuation, but they focus. You've got your... They start at 5? They start at 5. And you so are... when, when they say 615, they've got two sets of budgets ahead of you. 
on the 12th and then senior centers ahead of you on the 26th. So anything we don't finish on the 12th, we can pick up on the 26th. Okay. So when do I have to be here? I don't have to be, I mean, I probably will be here at the beginning, but five I don't think, yeah, I don't think you have to be here right at five. I think you could come in at like 5.30. Well, out of respect. 5.45. Um, you are going to be posted jointly for the entire thing. So it does give you the opportunity, if you come at 5, to hear all the other presentations. Um, and we can zoom in too, Tim. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I would anticipate showing up for some of them, but some of them will probably just be here. Yeah, so that's why I had Brenda send me the schedule. They talked about it on Monday, but I had her send me the schedule and she made a change to it. So what you see now is the most recent one. What you see in your packet is the most recent one. If there's changes, we'll try to get those out to you. All right. My recollection from last year is that Julie likes to start at five and end close to seven. She does, and there are a couple of times where they've got meetings coming up after, like I think February 5th, there's a planning board meeting, so they're gonna go from five to about uh, 6.15. Um, and meetings that they don't have a Monday interface, they'll go, probably you're right, till about seven. She likes to keep it to about two hours. Um, can you just resend that to email to me? The what? Um, the email on the schedule on the for the finance committee. with the schedule sure yeah who they yeah, have might, because I don't I can't well, seem to find it might as well hit us all up okay just yeah right. I can't seem to find it here I mean I have the dates of all the finance meetings but not who they're not the, the breakdown that's why yeah. I asked for the schedule okay yeah that would be great if you could just send it out again um, all right okay I will write so, myself a note and do we have a, I mean. We don't have a, a meeting date yet for um, um, meeting with the, about the sewer treatment plan, but maybe we can do a couple of budget items when we get a meeting. To a meeting, on a meeting for yeah, that? Just okay. to have, well, like contracted services. I, I would imagine that's going to be. That's probably the most discussion. difficult one. Yeah, that's going that to be like board of two health. or three meetings that we would want to. We would want some input into that. And, you know, it's, a lot of it is, is routine. It's just when you're looking at things where you know you have to increase your security for Outlook and stuff, and you know that you need to update, upgrade your phone system because it's going to die, and if it dies, we're screwed. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, I, I hope that Chris, Chris, uh, you've looked at that cybersecurity stuff through the cybersecurity, new cybersecurity agency, right? How much we, I know you're doing some, um, some grants, but there are, uh, have you searched the whole um, site for whatever they're offering? Because I keep hearing about all, what everybody else is doing when I come go to these meetings like Homeland Security, because we have to be very- Yeah, careful. there are definitely some good resources, um, and I picked up on a lot of them at the MMA meeting, actually. I went to the cybersecurity workshop. Um, so there are definitely a lot of good resources out there for municipalities. We are expecting to hear back within the next week to two weeks about the, um, I can't remember the abbreviation right now, but it's, it's the um, Office FBI. of Municipal and School Technologies uh, grant that provides no cost cybersecurity training Perfect. to municipalities. Um, yeah. And we, we applied early and it's first come first serve. So I, I don't really have any concerns that okay. we wouldn't good. get it, but. Yeah, hoping to get the uh, official announcement soon. Because we have, we have to do a certain amount of spending um, for cybersecurity at Homeland Security monies that we have. But we also are starting to step on toes of the state and what they're trying to do. So I just want to make sure you're tuned into the state because the state is handing, handing out money right now on this. So All right, I'll take a look. Well, yeah, that just was, keep that an was eye part on of it. it. Just keep an eye on it. All right? Thank you. Um, all right. Okay. So just to add that as an item that we'll do some budgeting, okay, when we have... At the meeting, we... Yeah, so we have a few minutes to talk about, like, contractor services, you know, just some, some of the more complicated parts of our budget. 
we need, we as a select board want to set our priorities and, and how we want money to be spent. You know, because the finance committee is going to look at, you know, the increase and say, well, you know, it's way out of line. But we. Well, to some extent, you've set them. You, I, know, I know, you know, but we want we want to talk about what we feel is the most important, and then why, so that we're all on right. the same page. Right. Okay? When we go to talk to the finance committee about it, okay, that's all I want is just more time to have some discussion. Okay. Did you have any other questions, Tim? No, but I I did want to mention that. Um, SCEMS is planning to have a pinning ceremony. Yep. And you are aware of that, Casey? I am. And we should invite the police department chief, et cetera, mm -hmm. you know, whomever from public safety that. Well, we should invite all our public safety, you know, the yeah. fire department. That's what I'm saying, yeah. Yeah, and the water districts as partners. Yeah, we're going to have to. Yeah, Tim reached out today about it. And when, when is it? It's, the, it's at 5 p.m. on um, February 15, and I believe it's going to take place it's here. It's going to be here. And, okay. Yeah. Right, Chris? Sorry, can you say that again? The, the, uh, the pinning ceremony is the 15th here at the municipal offices, right? That is correct, at 5 p.m. So we need to work with Tim to make sure we invite all the public safety personnel. And the water district, all our partners. All our partners. Okay. So I got to change the location of this too. Is is there some reason we didn't do it at? Because we have a skims meeting that sits. Yeah, this is what I'm. I, I, they didn't have a big enough space. Oh, oh, right. oh, oh! I see. I see. Yeah. yeah. That's what I was just. Kind of, wait a minute. We're skims at six. So yeah, they want to do it an hour before. Oh no, yeah. that makes total sense. I'm fine with that. Yeah. That makes sense. I, I didn't think about that. There isn't, I mean, the conference room isn't big enough. No. COVID central if we got everybody jammed in there. Well, no, we usually do the bays, but it's cold. It could be cold that night. Yeah. So we can't do it out in the bay, you know, just take the ambulances out. That's where we normally have stuff. Mm -hmm. If we have a crowd. But it is middle of winter, so that doesn't make sense either. Okay. Well, I'll take a motion. To motion adjourn. to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Tim Hilchey, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Okay. Thank you, everybody.